Section 24 of Through East Anglia in a Motor Car by J. E. Vincent. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 11 of Through East Anglia in a Motor Car by J. E. Vincent. Great ambitions cheerfully relinquished. Halston to Cromer via Bungie, Beckles, Lowestoft, Great Yarmouth, Caster by Yarmouth, and Norwich. Part 2. Hard by is Caster by Yarmouth, formerly supposed to have been a Roman fortress, but on quite insufficient evidence. At best, according to Mr. Haverfield, it was never more than a Roman village, and Mr. Haverfield knows. That red brick tower of Caister Castle, however, reminds us of the Paston letters already mentioned and one of the most ancient collections of private letters ever given to the public to be a mirror of life in the days of long ago. The castle was built by that renowned knight and valiant soldier, Sir John Falstolf, who died in 1459. Sir John was not only a hard fighter, but also clearly a man of extended property. He had land so far off as Dedham, close to the Suffolk boundary of Essex, the Dedham that Constable painted, and we find him complaining once, Item, Sir John Buck, parson of Stratford, fished my stanks at Dedham and helped to break my dam, destroyed my new mill, and was always against me at Dedham. This complaint was made to John Paston, afterwards Sir John Paston, then Sir John Falstolf's steward, agent as we should say now, and residing in his employer's castle. The employer died. The agent, upon what title the letters do not make it quite clear, continued to hold the castle, on which his wife, Dame Paston, lived while he followed the practice of the law in London, even to the judicial bench. Something has been said of these letters before, but there are points to be added. The early printed volumes, stately and calf-bound, are a luxury to read, and in spite of Sir John Fenn's omissions, they contain all manner of curiosities, the best of them, perhaps, being a letter written by one of the young Pastons in 1467, from Eton, where he was at school. In it, he shows anxiety about a consignment of figs and raisins, promised but not arrived, discusses the fortune of a young lady recently met, whom he thinks of marrying, and says to his brother, And as for her beauty, judge you that when ye see her, if so be that ye take the labore and specially behold her handies, for, and if it be as is told me, she is disposed to be thick. Here, by the way, is an example of Sir John Fenn's weakness as an editor, since, the original sentence being innocent of stops, save at the end, he places a comma after hands, and after B, and another after me, thus making his own unnecessary translation far more obscure than the original. It is worth while to remember that Eton College had at this time been open for twenty-five years only, was in fact quite a new school, and that the headmaster was William Barber. It was during this run, by a circuitous route from Caister by Yarmouth to Acle and Norwich, and when the wide sheet of Philby Broad smiled on either hand, that the feeling of opposition to Mr. Rye's view of the Broads grew strong. That magnificent stretch of water appealed with a strength almost irresistible 
to one for whom sailing was before motoring came into existence the most perfect of pleasures and although circumstances and circumstances only tendered resistance possible it seems but right to glance at the broads to say what they and the country around them are like and how in the opinion of one fairly well versed in watermanship they might best be enjoyed there is a stock delimination of the broad district draw a line from haysborough to norwich another line from lowestoft to norwich and the rough triangle formed by those lines and the sea shall be the broads district really the southern side of the triangle is drawn much too low on the map except alton broad and lake loathing which are close to lowestoft and also a long way from the other broads all the broads including Braden water would be included in a triangle having a line from norwich to galston for its southern boundary they are philby ormsby borough and rollsby all connected and covering no less than six hundred acres between them hickling hayham horsey and marlham broads hickling the finest of them all and ersted and barton and each group is approached by its own river now travel by motor car is not recommended in this district for it is much too flat to be enjoyable since that is not recommended nothing is said about the churches although they are of some interest for so long as men and women remain what they are they will not stop to study relics of antiquity unless they are very exceptional indeed when travelling by boat nor are they in the least more likely to linger in this way when voyaging by motor-boat than when using a sailing boat but shall we voyaging in the spirit use either sailing boat or motor boat in the ordinary acceptation of the latter term in truth neither is suggested but rather a compromise candor compels the admission that knowing by sight and in some cases from personal experience most of the types of motor-boat built in great britain i cannot recall one of them which being roomy enough for comfort would not draw too much water to be serviceable in fact if one could rely on the wind a sailing vessel of one of the types which have been evolved in the district to meet its needs would really be preferable elsewhere than in these pages i should certainly take it and enjoy it vastly but what i might take in these pages and what would be much better than either would be one of those big flat bottom sailing craft with auxiliary motor engines of which one may see some at english exhibitions but many more at the annual exhibition in paris with them you can really sail when there is a wind and without a breeze you are independent as for the joy of it so long as there is wind to fill the sails the mere act of dashing through the water and gliding over it the very sound of the water the sense of absolute control that comes to him who holds the tiller and trims the sails to meet every need are enough without worrying over scenery moreover the wide flatness of the broads district the rare buildings rising as from a lake have a special charm of their own as for the sport from all that i can learn it is largely a thing of the past so far as duck and wild fowl are concerned all the same it is a bad mistake to omit the broads and one which experto crede 
the tourist in east anglia regrets deeply when it is irretrievable however there is no doubt i made it but happily hardly less doubt that if i had not made it the results could hardly have been relevant on then we went to norwich by way of caister not as before through acle and dined at the maid's head as on our last visit and admired the ancient hotel and the red waistcoat of the head waiter as much as ever but afterwards instead of seeing something of the famous city by night we pushed on towards cromer on the high road by moonlight that is not the best way to see the country of course and it would be sheer hypocrisy which happens to be unnecessary to say anything in detail of the normal aspect of the places past or of their associations if they had any still of all kinds of travelling yet tried by me it was emphatically the most delightful the air was very transparent and not too cool the moon bathed the landscape which was fairly free from hills there was little traffic on the roads save here and there a farmer jogging home in his dog-cart from norwich market the acetylene lamps were doing their duty nobly which is by no means always their custom we felt as if we should like to go on all night at cromer certainly we would not stop we would make the coast there and skirt the sea by moonlight certainly so far as wells next sea possibly so far as hunstanton all things went merrily as marriage bells the car sped smoothly as a soaring albatross silently as death itself but stay what was that a sharp little report like the crack of a miniature rifle was heard from below it was not a tire again that was sure we knew by heart every noise that a failing tire could make a little farther the car went quite well cromer was now some five miles distant and then the noises began again in quick and staccato succession in another environment they might have reminded us of a feu de jouie to our present predicament no words could have been more completely inappropriate what was the trouble was it something wrong with the ignition no said our philosophic friend at the wheel it is not ignition there is one of the blessings of experience a little time ago i should have wasted time in fiddling with the ignition now i know it is not that and i know there is nothing to be done to-night there is no strainer fixed to the tank in this car the good man who refilled for us at norwich used no strainer and some grit has got into the petrol to find it i must first put out all lights and then go right back piece by piece from the carburettor backwards until i can discover the obstacle that is impossible in the dark we must bear the noise and push on if we can to the hotel at cromer possibly the foreign matter whatever it is may have dissolved by the morning so seeing from excellent example that misfortune faced with a smile loses three-quarters of its annoyance we went on at quite a good pace too sometimes silently for a hundred yards sometimes with loud reports as of a gun at the covert side sometimes with spluttering as of boys crackers on the fifth of november but we laughed at them all and won our way to cromer won our way too up the steep and sinuous hill that leads to the lynx hotel 
there we had good fortune indeed the hotel had been open that day only after the winter of sleep and desolation a huge fire roared in the ample hall belated guests were none the less welcome in that so far as we could see there were but two other guests golfers both in that vast hotel had we come a night earlier our fate had been bad indeed the hotel judged by bed and breakfast seemed to me of the first order of merit the charges compared with those of the angel at bury seemed high still it was more replete with every modern luxury than the angel it possessed bathrooms for example which are indispensable to the motorist and it was a very present help in trouble such was our view the next morning when the inevitable bill not a very big one after all having regard to the class of the hotel was presented other things also came to mind that following morning a morning of gauzy mist not obscuring the view even lending enchantment to some of it and promising a fine day some of them were obvious the position of the hotel looking down from a commanding height on town and sea was perfect for prospect and for bracing air the golf links close by were an undeniable attraction to the large army of men and women who have yielded to the seductions of that most fascinating game it would have been unreasonable to expect low charges but all the same the contrast between this bill and that paid at bury was a little stronger than it ought to be in a well-regulated country other things were not so immediately obvious since for some it was the wrong season and others were hidden in pleasant and well-remembered books we were in the heart of poppy land concerning which mr clement scott and others raved but it was too soon for the poppies poor dan lino's red red poppies now to be heard only on the gramophone to be on view it was however not difficult to conjure them up in imagination having seen them before all over those sandy uplands in the runton direction they are very pretty beyond doubt they add glorious lakes of colour to a rather monotonous landscape but they mean poor and sandy land and that although it does not matter to the motorist unless he happens to own some of it and to be unable to let it for building spells dust in dry weather and lots of it too is cromer a choice worthy place in which to spend a summer holiday the answer not perhaps the answer which appears at first to be given lies in or under this extract from the gurneys of earlham mr hare began by saying a picture of the summer family life at cromer much like that of the present day is given in the following letter it is one from reichenda gurney to elizabeth fry the elizabeth fry good angel of gloomy newgate prison of course cromer september the eighth eighteen o three our party is now complete as john continues with us and the buxtons arrived yesterday it was extremely pleasant to us seeing them both again particularly fowell their being here will add very much to our pleasure as there is a suitability between us and the buxtons which always makes it pleasant for us to be together our time here is spent in a way that exactly suits the place and the people all are left in perfect liberty to do as they like all day or to form any engagement 
yet the party is so connected that hardly a day passes but some plan is fixed for all of us to meet when all are met it is an uncommonly pretty sight such a number of young women and so many if not pretty very nice looking i wish thee could have seen us the other afternoon sally gave a grand entertainment at the hall where everybody met the ladies almost all dressed in white gowns and blue sashes with nothing on their heads after dinner we all stood on a wall eighteen of us and it was really one of the prettiest sights i ever saw to give thee an idea how we are going on i will tell thee how we generally pass the day the weather since we came has on the whole been very fine so imagine us before breakfast with our trout backs or hats on and coloured gowns running in all directions on the sands jetty etc after breakfast we receive callers from the other houses and fix with them the plans for the day after this we now and then get an hour's quiet for reading and writing though my mind has been so much taken up with other things that i have found it almost impossible to apply to anything seriously at eleven we go down in numbers to bathe and enjoy the sands which about that time look beautiful most of our party and the rest of the cromer party come down and bring a number of different carriages which have a very pretty effect after bathing we either ride on horseback or take some pleasant excursion or other i never remember enjoying the sea so much and never liked cromer a quarter so well some of us continually dine out whilst the others receive company at home john has been a great addition to our party i hope he has enjoyed himself we have had two or three most merry days since he came the day before yesterday we spent at sheringham wandering about the woods and sketching all the morning every one met at a beautiful spot for dinner with three knives and forks and two or three plates between twenty-six people all manner of games took place after dinner which john completely entered into and seemed to enjoy as much as any of the party we completed our day by a delightful musical evening miss gordon our old cromer friend came to tea she played and sang to us all the evening in a wonderful style john goes away on sunday he stays over to-night to be at a dance which some very agreeable people who are at cromer mr and mrs windham are going to give and which i think must be very pleasant could anything be more simply delightful what can the man mean by hinting that the answer to the question whether cromer is a choice worthy place for a summer holiday is not plainly to be read on the face of this artless letter such it is easy to imagine would be the question asked if the early victorian practice continued if somebody read these pages aloud with pauses for comment and criticism while ladies of various ages embroidered or contrived trousers for unwilling heathens to wear as a cover for their natural nakedness and as a testimony of recently acquired christianity my dear madam as thackeray might have said pause for a moment and reflect are you a gurney a fry a buxton do you bear any of the other names perfectly well known which are a password to this most admirable and worthy society read also what mr walter rye has to say on the same topic 
pray note that the letter is of eighteen o three but that mr hare's book published in eighteen ninety five says that the picture of eighteen o three would serve very well for a picture of the present day have you ever tried as a stranger a summer holiday at a seaside place which has been frequented by the same families for a few years let alone a place to which the same families have resorted for generations as is the case at cromer and in its vicinity or again have you ever being a member of such a society known what it is to see new families discover the oasis which seemed your very own and what have been your feelings towards those new families have you not in the first case felt uncomfortable a goat among sheep in the second case perceived at once that the newcomers were of goat-like nature in all this vivid letter there are but two allusions to persons outside the charm circle miss gordon and the windhams miss gordon was clearly a cromer institution and it is probable to the verge of certainty if only from the name that the windhams were a norfolk family less than ten years before william windham the statesman and darling of the county had distinguished himself when stoned during an election at norwich by jumping out of his carriage and collaring his assailant he was the same william windham who quelled a mutiny in the local militia by seizing the leader and thrashing two of his followers such conduct was not perhaps entirely to the mind of the gurneys and their friends but for all that the chances are that this mr and mrs windham were kinsfolk of one who was no man of peace at any price cromer seems to me on a priori grounds and if the truth may be told from information received also to be entirely the place for the members of a justly respected circle whose title to it is clear and not to be begrudged but a place in which a stranger to that circle is as the common saying goes out of it it is emphatically a good place for a golfer but otherwise all along this piece of the coast there is precious little for the ordinary man or woman to do there is the sea of course but the coastline is too regular and the sea too open to provide that variety of scenery which gives to little pleasure cruisers their chief pleasure also of course there are roads upon which the motorist may take his pleasure and some of them pass through or near places attractive in the present as they were in the past nay even more attractive since to see them stir up memories of the past but two things must be said a seaside place as a centre for motoring walking or bicycling is by its very essence one-sided or even less lay a pen across the map horizontally at cromer and it is plain that there is no way for the motorist towards more than half the points of the compass as for the coast scenery of which we shall shortly take a considerable sample it is full of individual character the kind of scenery one may visit with pleasure once or twice or even three times but to a man not of norfolk blood it seems no more than that such certainly is the final impression left by the coast drive to the west of cromer and in cromer itself are far too many new houses to the eastward especially if the coast be left behind the scenery is better possessed of 
if it may be so put, more abiding charm. To the westward it is more strange, weird and individual than beautiful, and its weirdness is of the kind inspiring to melancholy, not to awe. This summary of opinion, however, is in the nature of an anticipation. It shall be justified piecemeal so soon as we are fairly under way, so that a new chapter can be begun. Let this chapter close with the last unhappy episode in a supremely happy tour, with which episode it would be discordant to mix the undiluted pleasure of the next chapter. We started, for us, rather early. That is to say, we breakfasted at half-past seven and left the hotel door slightly after eight. All down the zigzag hill into the town, the machinery said nothing at all. There was no reason why it should make any demonstration, since it had no work to do. Once called upon to work, however, the car soon began to crackle and to splutter again. There was no room for doubt what was the matter. Foreign matter had found its way into the petrol tank and beyond, and it was hard stuff, genuine grit, undissolved by a night's soaking. Whether the ostler at the maid's head, or he of Bury St Edmunds, was to blame, and in justice to the former, it must be said that it might have been either, the nuisance was beyond question. It was Sunday morning too. It was hardly likely that the repair shops would be of any assistance, at any rate so early in the morning, and, empty as the streets were then, it would not have been seemly to begin in them, at about the hour of the earliest service, an operation which might very likely consume an hour or more. So up the hill on the far side of the town we crawled, for Cromer lies in the hollow of a cup, snorting and grunting not a little, in sickly fashion and with much trouble, as the Latin exercises used to put it, and out onto the sandy road, leading between sandy and windswept fields towards Runton. There, Thanking our stars that few wayfarers were astir, we stopped, and Mr. Johnson, cheerfully remarking that those who could be of no help, because there is only room for one big man face upwards under a car, had better go for a little walk and see some of the country, addressed himself with a smile and a half-groan, to his odious task, with its infinite possibilities in the way of black and viscous lubricant dropping into his hair or onto his face. In this posture I left him, his legs alone visible, for a little tour of inspection, but there was no temptation to prolong it. A walk of a hundred yards or two along a bank, covered sparsely with harsh and wiry grass and dividing two fields both equally poverty-stricken brought me to the crumbling edge of a sandy cliff not high enough to impose by its grandeur not rugged enough to please by its outline below was a beach of sand beyond that the smooth grey hazy sea with not a vessel of any kind visible on its sluggish surface. To the westward was Runton, a conglomeration of commonplace brick houses, glaringly new, obviously intended for lodgings. A windmill and its house were the only buildings in any way calculated to give satisfaction to the eye. From there, it roved on to undulating hills, probably of sand, as indeed was everything else except the raw houses of Runton. Rambling in this poppy land, sans poppies, seemed weary, flat, stale, and unprofitable. 
a return to the car revealed mr johnson still in the back position as riflemen say and sundry stray bits of the car and tools lying on the road by his side a glance at him obtained by crouching showed him to be much hotter much dirtier than before more smilingly determined than ever if possible to make nothing of his personal trouble he was not so much a good man fighting against adversity as a master of science wrestling with a problem he knew that he could solve in time and solve it with triumph he did a few minutes more and he half wriggled half rolled into the open road dusty but jubilant holding a little piece of pipe some five inches long and of infinitesimal bore in his hands here is the little brute he said with a gentle smile and then made his one mistake of the day and it cost him dear just touching one end of the pipe with his lips and holding his hollowed palm by the other he blew one breath out came the obstruction hardly bigger than a snapdragon seed surely the tiniest little imp of a particle that ever hampered the circulation of a mighty machine the mechanical trouble was over for ever or at any rate for that expedition a very few minutes sufficed to prepare the car for the road again and she accomplished over two hundred miles more that day without so to speak turning a hair so did the man who cured her because he knew her complaint to a nicety but he was in my company all that day until seven or eight in the evening and the thoroughly abominable taste of petrol was in his mouth to the end in fact you may rinse with raw brandy your mouth if you will but the reek of the petrol will cling to it still such is a valuable little piece of experience gained by proxy the morals are three and obvious first every tank or funnel should be fitted with an irremovable strainer secondly if this be not so superintend refilling yourself and see that a temporary strainer is used thirdly if grit does get into the petrol through omission of these precautions and blowing a pipe becomes necessary wrap up the mouth of that pipe with care or preferably get somebody else and best of all an idle bystander to do the blowing for you for this service if rendered by a boy a shilling is a sufficient recompense and you may depart at your leisure but if it be done by a man especially if he be large and rough give him half a crown and stand not long on the order of your going end of chapter 11 part 2《Of Through East Anglia in a Motor Car》by J. E. Vincent A Priory, Great Houses and the Fens, Part 1 Practical Observations Cromer wells fakenham lynn ely cambridge and royston roads fair from cromer to wells good from wells to lynn and from lynn to cambridge hills none of moment but no monotony of level except between lynn and cambridge distances cromer to wells next sea twenty and a half miles wells to fakenham nine and three-quarter miles fakenham to lynn twenty-one and three-quarter miles 
Lynn to Ely, 29 miles. Ely to Cambridge, 16 miles. Cambridge to Royston, 13 and a half miles. Note well, Royston is 42 and a quarter from London, and a good point of exit for the Midlands. From this point we never looked back, as the saying goes, mechanically. Our troubles were over, and we looked forward to our drive along the north coast of Norfolk with intense eagerness. It is a pleasure in retrospect now, but it was not quite the same sort of pleasure as had been anticipated in previous topographical innocence. The road we had taken, designedly on leaving Cromer, when it was determined to follow the sea as closely as possible, left Felbrigg and Sheringham, justly beloved of artists, on one side, passed through Lower Sheringham, Weybourne, Salis, Clynex Sea, Blakeney and Stiffkey, to Wells next sea. They were not in themselves particularly interesting villages, although I remember that at one of them, I think it was Weybourne, to which the road winds inwards from the sea a little, and where there is some shelter of a hill from the salt winds, there were fine trees about the church, and another little church on the left-hand side of the road at Blakeney, had one full-sized tower at the west end and another funny little tower at the east end. The prevailing impression left by the whole drive is of impressive desolation. The road dead flat for the most part, but not half bad in point of surface, runs as close to the sea as its makers dared to lay it. On the right, as one journeys westward, are wide stretches, half sea and half marsh. On the left is a range of low hills. Sometimes it is close at hand, at others it recedes a little, and the space between the road and the hills is again a species of half marsh. The streams, running parallel to the road often, have a look of being partly tidal. The sides of the road are guarded by a fence, the bottom part of which clearly shows that at spring tides, especially if they be aggravated by the wind, the sea must flow over the road also. Else, whence came that fringe of withered seaweed hanging round the bottom of the fence? Small wonder that the folk in these parts have preserved, in Clyne next sea and in Wales next sea, the reminder that the sea is close at hand. It is with them always, threatening them, devouring their land, strewing their flat shore with wreckage. From Cly, for some miles to the westward, extends a bill of sandy land, not very high, enclosing a long lagoon, apparently very shallow, and the outlook over this lagoon, with the dreary ridge of land broken, if memory serves correctly, only by a lighthouse, is intensely and absolutely characteristic. One feels no sort of desire to see it again, unless indeed it is, as by its appearance, it well might be a haunt of wildfowl worth shooting, but at the same time it is good to have seen it once in order to know what this scenery of the most remote and northerly district of Norfolk is like, and to realise the kind of life which its scanty population must lead. They live face to face with nature in her sourest mood, Nature never majestic, except when the storms come from the northward, smiling but a hard smile when the sun shines. In fact, this is a stretch of land, when it is worthy of the name, dismal as the mind of man can conceive. 
when you get to wells next sea where the houses are plain but of some age and there is a little port on a winding creek the aspect of the country changes for the better or rather it so changed for us because we determined to give the coast up and to take the inland road via fakenham and flitcham for king's lynn for this route there was ample reason close at hand in holcombe hall walsingham binham abbey and houghton about all of which a good deal must needs be said with as little tedium be it hoped as possible before saying it however it may be as well to state that in another chapter and that the last king's lynn will be treated as an imaginary centre for many little drives imagination since it has happened to me often to stay at lynn for many days together and to explore the surrounding country and roads will not be severely taxed and the method is adopted for the convenience of writer and reader in this chapter we have before us the historic houses just named and after them the fens from lynn to cambridge these last we drive through in the early afternoon taking in the character of them better than on any previous occasion so the material for this chapter is at least ample if we added to it castle rising the birthplace of nelson the sandringham country divine in its kind hunstanton brancaster and king's lynn last of all the chapter must run to unwieldy and intolerable length at binham we have part of the benedictine abbey enveloped in ivy and part still used as a church a very fine piece of unspoiled norman work for holcombe abbeys castles and ancient halls by mr john timms and mr alexander gunn is a treasure house of information holcombe is her ligam holy home and it was the work of the famous kent under the direction of thomas coke lord leicester who himself spent many years in italy studying the works of pelagio coke of norfolk as the lord leicester of george the second's time was called was emphatically a landowner who deserved to be magnificently housed an inscription over the entrance to the great hall records the fact that this seat on an open barren estate was planned planted built decorated and inhabited in the middle of the eighteenth century by thomas coke earl of leicester it naturally does not record the fact that the barren estate for such it was is now mainly by virtue of coke of norfolk's sagacity in planting one of the most nobly timbered to be found anywhere in the kingdom and a perfect paradise for game first and for those who shoot game later in one respect the great lord coke's plans were changed one might almost write providentially it had been intended to build the outside of the hall of bath stone but an earth was found in a neighbouring parish which produced bricks of much the same colour as bath stone but heavier and closer in texture that was as it should be coke of norfolk had bought much of the land and by enclosing cultivating and planting had practically made it it was part of the fitness of things that a mansion of almost peerless magnificence as far as its noble proportions its gorgeous decorations and its art and literary treasures were concerned should be built out of bricks baked out of norfolk earth the hall stands in a spacious but level park 
and a glimpse of it may be had from the road in the middle is a great quadrangular block having at each angle a wing seventy feet by sixty feet connected with the central block by a corridor the wings are the stranger's wing the family wing the chapel wing and the kitchen wing the library and the manuscripts rooms are in the family wing the gallery of statues and the state apartments are in the central block this is one hundred and fourteen feet by sixty two feet its most noble feature being the hall suggested to lord leicester by pelagio's plan for a court of justice and having a gallery round three sides of it of the pictures the most notable are claude's apollo and marseilles in a landscape and other landscapes van dyck's Poussin's, a raphael and a rubens there is also a group of nineteen figures by michelangelo the manuscripts are of great value and curiosity and contain amongst other things the papers of the great chief justice in fact holcombe is in itself for its contents and for the story of its creation one of the most wonderful places in this marvellous england of ours and that is why so much is here written concerning it in a book whose author is not at all eager to pry into the houses of other and greater men who were these cokes who attained so much magnificence that is a natural question the name is first traceable in a deed of 1206 referring to a coke of didlington from him descended edward coke the commentator on littleton who was attorney general speaker of the house of commons and chief justice of the king's bench in 1613 oddly enough from our modern point of view it was after this that he was elected member for buckinghamshire and drafted and moved the petition of rights no doubt he made a great deal of money himself he acquired more by marrying first one of the pastons and after her death the lady elizabeth cecil daughter of the first earl of exeter such was the real founder of the family who bought or acquired by inheritance much of the existing holcombe estate his grandson died unmarried and the estate fell to a kinsman henry coke of thorrington from him sprung sir thomas coke the first earl of leicester whose son died in seventeen thirty nine when the peerage became extinct but the estate went to sir thomas coke's nephew wenham roberts who naturally took the name of coke and also naturally called his son thomas and this son was coke of norfolk the handsome englishman as he was called at rome in whose favour the peerage was most justly revived it was due not so much to his magnificence as to his service to agriculture all a country from holcombe to houghton was a wild sheep walk writes arthur young before the spirit of improvement seized the inhabitants and this spirit has wrought amazing effects for instead of boundless wilds and uncultivated wastes inhabited by scarcely anything but sheep the country is all cut up into enclosures cultivated in a most husband-like manner richly manured well peopled and yielding an hundred times the produce that it did in its former state what has wrought these great works is the marling for under the whole country run veins of a very rich kind which they dig up and spread upon the old sheep walks and then by means of enclosing 
they throw their farms into regular course of crops and gain immensely by the improvement for this coke of norfolk was principally responsible and for this his name deserves all honour at walsingham the remains of the priory are interesting a magnificent door a gateway the walls windows and arches of the refectory a norman arch with zigzag mouldings the rest of the remains are later decorated and perpendicular but the record of the foundation and of the pilgrimages to the shrine which was second only to canterbury in importance is much more entertaining first the chapel of the virgin was founded by the widow of richaldy the mother of geoffrey de favreches of course everybody knows all about them then geoffrey himself started on a pilgrimage to the holy sepulchre having previously executed a deed in which granted to god and st mary and to edwy his clerk the chapel which his mother richaldy had built at walsingham and other real property to the intent that edwy should establish a priory there the supreme treasure was a relic the alleged milk of the virgin purchased as an inscription seen by erasmus high upon a wall stated from an old woman at constantinople with an assurance that it was far superior to any other relic of the same kind as it alone had been taken from the breast the other having fallen to the ground first it was enclosed in crystal and set in a crucifix this says the matter-of-fact erasmus occasionally looked like chalk mixed with the white of eggs and was quite solid that the more pilgrims the richer the better might be attracted to visit this relic and to lay down their offerings often very costly it was stated by the monks that the milky way in the firmament pointed to walsingham so it did no doubt so it does on occasion now and to a lot of other places besides the virgin and her son as they made their salute also appeared to erasmus and his friend to give them a nod of approbation the sentence last quoted wherein the meaning is a great deal clearer than the construction comes from messrs timbs and gunn let me place side by side with it another quotation from froude's lecture on times of erasmus and luther the rule of the church was nothing for nothing at a chapel in saxony there was an image of a virgin and child if a worshipper came in with a good handsome offering the child bowed and was gracious if the present was unsatisfactory it turned away its head and withheld its favours till the purse strings were untied again there was a great rood or crucifix of the same kind at boxley in kent where the pilgrims went in thousands this figure used to bow too when it was pleased and a good sum of money was sure to secure its good will when the reformation came and the police looked into the matter the images were found to be worked with wires and pulleys the german lady was kept as a curiosity in the cabinet of the elector of saxony our boxley rood was brought up and exhibited in cheapside and was afterwards torn to pieces by the people no sort of disrespect towards the roman catholic religion is involved in recording this absolutely true statement of historical fact the trick described was undoubtedly played upon pilgrims in saxony and in kent whether it was justifiable from some points of view matters not at all the roman catholic religion is a great truth 
may conceivably be the most exact and precise truth behind all this kind of thing it is considerably more than likely that similar devices were employed at walsingham they may even have been employed by ecclesiastics otherwise blameless for the rules of the professional practice still occasionally justify strange conduct or seem to justify it but the evidence if there was any was destroyed at the dissolution when thomas cromwell took the sacred image away to chelsea and burned it henry the eighth on this occasion by the way got some of his own back he too like other kings and queens native and foreign had made the pilgrimage to walsingham before his quarrel with rome and had walked the last four miles or so from barsham barefooted query whether when a king was on pilgrimage bent the roads were spread with soft sand as they are now with sand and gravel when king edward is going to make a progress in london henry gave an offering in the shape of a priceless necklace but he secured it again in later life and may even have given it to one of the wives of whom it may be remembered he had several an account of the ceremonies used quoted again from messrs timbs and gunn is not without interest the pilgrim who arrived at walsingham entered the sacred precinct by a narrow wicket it was purposely made difficult to pass as a precaution against the robberies which were frequently committed at the shrine on the gate in which the wicket opened was nailed a copper image of a knight on horseback whose miraculous preservation by the virgin formed the subject of one of the numerous legendary stories with which the place abounded to the east of the gate within stood a small chapel where the pilgrim was allowed for money to kiss a gigantic bone said to have been the finger bone of saint peter after this he was conducted to a building thatched with reeds and straw enclosing two wells in high repute for indigestion and headaches and also for the rare virtue of ensuring to the votary within certain limits whatever he might wish for at the time of drinking their water the building itself was said to have been transported through the air many centuries before in a deep snow and as proof of it the visitor's attention was gravely pointed to an old bearskin attached to one of the beams the twain wells called also the wishing wells an anonymous ballad speaks of a chapel of st lawrence standeth now there fast by tween valleys experience do thus and law there she the widow thought to have set this chapel which was begun by our lady's counsel all night the widow permaining in this prayer our blessed lady with blessed ministries herself being her chief artificer arreared this said house with angels handies and not only reared it but set in there it is that is twin hundred feet more in distance from the first place folk make remembrance of a very truth as froude said the world is so changed that we can hardly recognize it as the same imagination retires baffled from the effort to picture kings and queens walking barefoot over primitive norfolk roads passing through a wild waste too for coke of norfolk was not yet born to go through these ceremonies and to present their gifts erasmus with his tongue in his cheek is easily conjured up so are the robbers whom the shrine attracted 
but why were there not any number of pilgrims in the sceptical mood of erasmus there seemed to have been plenty of robbers we pass the roads hereabout are flat as the sands of the sea the land about them richly timbered and there is nothing else to be said of them from the ruins of a religious house to one indissolubly associated with the names of two men each exceptionally worldly each in his own singular way and with that of one remarkably eccentric houghton hall was built by sir robert walpole from the designs of colin campbell while the former was prime minister and ripley say messrs timbs and gunn who speak with authority undoubtedly improved on colin campbell pope it is true wrote heaven visits with a taste the wealthy fool and needs no rod but ripley with a rule so ripley till his destined space is filled heaps bricks on bricks and fancies tis to build pope always bitter and not a little of a snob was hardly likely to have a good word to say for an architect who had been a working carpenter it is true too that lady hervey wrote in seventeen sixty five i saw houghton which is the most triste melancholy fine place i ever beheld tis a heavy ugly black building with an ugly black stone the hall saloon and gallery very fine the rest not in the least so time it may be has given the stone mellowness certain it is that houghton now in spite of a certain pretentiousness of ionic columns is really pleasing of houghton's most noted masters the walpoles a few words must be said but of two of them not many for they are well known to all the first lord orford was sir robert walpole the great prime minister who believed in letting well alone in corruption as a method of government in the venality of all men and in the collection of pictures it is curious but true that this most sagacious statesman was in a scholarly age no scholar and that this fastidious connoisseur of art was in a coarse age exceptionally plain spoken and free living when the then lord townsend heard that lord orford was at houghton he made a rule of leaving raynham and norfolk himself the second lord orford was of no account of the third i shall write a little more here than of the fourth because the eccentricities of the third are not so well known as are many of the details whimsical rather than eccentric of horace walpole the fourth and last lord orford sir robert walpole collected pictures by guido van dyck claude rubens rembrandt salvatore rosa teniere paul veronese wolvermans titian Poussin, snyders in a word by most of the best of the old masters and housed them in his majestic norfolk home girt by a park whose trees testify to this day to his skill in planting horace walpole who had loved houghton in his youth himself wrote in later life a catalogue of these pictures and a description of the apartments in which they hung the first lord orford slept with his fathers they had been walpoles of walpole in marshland since the time of richard i and his son reigned in his stead meanwhile his youngest son horace of whom it has been suspected on good grounds that he was not truly the son of the prime minister lived that curious life in that curious house strawberry hill 
details of which are known to many because they have passed into English literature. He was the best letter writer of modern times, or of nearly modern times, and his eccentricities are easily forgiven. He could afford them by virtue of two sinecures for life, which his all-powerful father had secured for him and he appears to have been perfectly happy building and altering his toy palace, collecting all sorts of curios, writing the most charming letters to his lady friends, writing for the press also, and childishly vain of his work, and hardly dreaming that he might succeed to the estate and the title. Even when, after the death of the second earl, the property fell to his eccentric son, Horace Walpole hardly seems to me to have realised that he might some day succeed to the title and the estate. He was growing to be an old man. His grief over the sale of the celebrated gallery was not that of an expectant heir. What of the third earl, who died without issue, and so left Horace Walpole to be the fourth and last Lord Orford. The world at large knows him as the madman who sold the first Lord Orford's unparalleled collection of pictures to Catherine of Russia. But he did many madder things than that, for, commercially speaking, he did not make a bad bargain over the sale of the pictures, for which he received more than his father had given. In him, the English love of sport ran to insane excess. Indeed, it even brought him to his death. At a time when he was under restraint, the date came when his greyhound, Tsarina, was matched to run a course. Devoted to coursing, as he had always been, he determined to be present, and, with the cunning of a madman, he jumped out of a window while his attendant was out of the room, ran to the stable, saddled his favourite pony, a piebald, galloped to the scene of the match, refused to go home in spite of all entreaties, saw Tsarina win, fell from his saddle, and died there and then. George, third earl could not have died more appropriately nor from his own point of view more happily he was mad of course very mad indeed but he was a thorough sportsman perhaps the maddest and at the same time most sporting thing he did was to train four stags to go four in hand he had reduced the deer to perfect discipline and, as he sat in his phaeton, and drove the handsome animals, he, no doubt, fancied he was performing no inconsiderable achievement. If the writer of that pompous sentence tried to break four stags, or even a pair, to harness with his own hands, he would not have much doubt of the quality of the achievement, that is, assuming he survived the effort but the stag four in hand almost brought Lord Orford to a sporting death before his time. He was driving his strange team to Newmarket, where he was a familiar figure, when a pack of hounds came across the scent and gave chase in full cry. The sequel, except for Lord Orford, must have been simply paralysingly funny. Picture it for a moment. Think of the stags, thoroughly panic-stricken, no longer trotting, but tearing along the road with huge bounds, of Lord Orford helpless on the box as the phaeton leapt and swayed, of the hounds racing behind, and of the savage music of their cry. It was, it must have been, a sight for gods and men, and many men saw it, for the run ended in the yard of the Ram at Newmarket, where Phaeton, Stags and Noble Driver disappeared into a barn and the doors were shut in the face of the clamouring pack. 
surely this is the maddest funniest true story that ever was told and the oddest part about it is that lord orford was not then and there clapped into a madhouse yet one cannot help feeling a lurking regard for this mad sportsman his foibles are more to the taste of some of us than the affectations of horace walpole End of chapter 12 part 1section twenty six of through east anglia in a motor car by j e vincent this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter twelve of through east anglia in a motor car by j e vincent a priory great houses and the fens part two by the road over which the mad earl of orford used to career with his extraordinary team over which horace walpole doubtless drove when he left his beloved london and strawberry for so he called it all short to fight an election at lynn we also drove in a chariot which to the eighteenth century norfolkian would have seemed just as strange as the phaeton and four stags would appear to us in the twentieth the motor-car however attracts less attention in north-western norfolk perhaps than in any other part of the kingdom for at sandringham are many motor-cars of many makes and some there are at the cottage also this part of the country learned before others did the elementary truth that there is no essential connection between speed and peril and it was good for automobilism that an object lesson should have been given in this respect by the magnificent cars daimlers for the most part of him whom the law regards as incapable of offence because he is the spring and source of the law itself of this country of heather bracken fir and oak of glorious gorse and of glowing rhododendrons of the numerous acclivities and declivities sufficient to give variety to the scene without trying the powers of any competent car of its air an incomparably sweet mixture of the breaths of the sea and of the moorland little will be said at this moment for the simple reason that in the next and final chapter i hope to be able to give an impression of its beauties at many times of the year from the point of view of a frequent eye-witness the whole distance from wells to king's lynn by way of fakenham which was our way is a generous thirty miles but the going was so good and the roads were so clear that we entered the great square of the old-fashioned lynn a little too early for luncheon having regard to the fact that engagements in the world which we had put out of sight began to bulk rather large in the near future the single town of any interest we passed through before reaching lynn was fakenham and we agreed with mr rye that it is a particularly clean and pleasant market town with several good old-fashioned inns especially the crown that is to say the first statement is endorsed from experience as to the second the responsibility rests with mr rye here also for those who care to halt is a singularly fine church showing many a crowned l in stone to testify that fakenham was once the headquarters in norfolk of the duchy of lancaster as for lynn some of us had visited it before one had sojourned in it long but his tale is postponed and time as has been mentioned 
began to press a little drifting on the roads careless of where you shall eat or where sleep is delightful but for most of us it cannot go on indefinitely and therein probably consists its chief charm it is of the essence of a treat to use the good old word of childhood that it should be more or less exceptional so at king's lynn we did but halt for a space at the globe in the corner of the wide and cobbled square and although a little rain began to fall compelled the newcomers to walk about a little and look at the narrow streets the estuary of the ooze and the custom house the compulsion had better have been omitted for lynn with its streets empty of people with the rain falling and with the tide out assuredly does not allure and that was the state of things on this sunday morning in april in other circumstances as it is hoped to prove ere long lynn and its people are much more attractive so the halt was not prolonged and the rain abating we started on the drive of forty-five miles roughly for ely and cambridge it took us through the heart of east anglian fens and the day was one in which the spirit of them entered into me or perhaps i having set my mind thereto entered into their spirit of a truth the task was one presenting little difficulty so far as the general mood was concerned for me at any rate there has never been any real gulf between the useful and the romantic to one nurtured at the foot of the mighty amphitheatre of the penryn slate quarries scooped out from the heart of a mountain rising in purple tiers of cyclopean scale the work of man so long as it be grand in outline and in purpose has always seemed to possess an entrancing beauty of its own men live who find the fens flat and uninteresting they demand our compassion by no means our censure or our scorn one does not despise a blind man because he cannot see and these men simply suffer from partial blindness physical and mental there is beyond all question a beauty of the fens as they are appealing to the eye alone they had another beauty for the eye in their original state original that is to say so far as human history reaches and of the nature of that original beauty a miniature presentment may be seen still at wickham fen which lies between the isle of ely and newmarket heath happy is the man or woman who can rejoice in both of these aspects of the fenland happier still because more intelligently charmed are those who while they travel through the rich cornland following the banks of rivers whose waters run at a level higher than those of the surrounding fields can picture to themselves the scene as it was before the skill and the courage of man made the good wheat grow where the reeds once waved made firm pasture for sleek cattle out of the quagmire caused domestic fowls to thrive in the sometime domain of the bittern and the heron men never tire of singing the praises of the dutch who by dogged courage and centuries of unrelaxing effort made a country for themselves a country to which they cling with a love passing the love of women the conquest of the fens begun so far as we know by the romans was in its way an enterprise of equal nobility and courage and vermoyden francis duke of bedford and rennie deserve credit 
great as any given to any Dutch engineer. The details are perhaps dull. They would certainly be out of place here. The result is grand, a colossal gain for humanity, which can best be realised and valued, be admired most cordially and warmly, as one rolls along solid roads where the fenmen of old stalked gingerly on stilts. Who will not remember the last words of Kingsley's Heroward the Wake when they are quoted? Let us send over to Normandy for a fair white stone of Carn, and let us carve a tomb worthy of thy grandparents. And what shall we write thereon? What but that which is here already? Here lies the last of the English. Not so, we will write, Here lies the last of the old English, but upon thy tomb, when thy time comes, the monks of Crowland shall write, Here lies the first of the new English, who, by the inspiration of God, began to drain the fens. Here is absolute truth of sentiment, and to say this is by no means to deny sympathetic appreciation of the dogged resistance offered by the fenmen of many generations to those who rescued the fens from the condition of a watery wilderness. Of course the fenmen hated the very idea of the subjugation of the marshland, their feeling towards those who began the long and arduous work differed only in degree from that with which the savage inhabitants of a new country, new to us, that is to say, regard the advance of civilization. They were not savages, but they were hard men and hardy, for only the fittest survived the agues and the fevers, accustomed to a free outdoor life having its pleasures no less than its trials let me quote kingsley overhead the arch of heaven spread more ample than elsewhere as over the open sea and that vastness gave and still gives such cloudlands such sunrises such sunsets as can be seen nowhere else within these isles. They might well have been star worshippers, those Gervai, had their sky been clear as that of the east, but they were like to have worshipped the clouds rather than the stars, according to the too universal law, that mankind worship the powers which do them harm rather than the powers which do them good. Their priestly teachers, too, had darkened still further their notion of the world around, as accursed by sin and swarming with evil spirits. The gods and fairies of their old mythology had been transformed by the church into fiends, alluring or loathsome, but all alike destructive to man, against whom the soldier of God, the celibate monk, fought day and night with relics, agnus dei, and sign of holy cross. And therefore the Danelaw men, who feared not mortal sword or axe, feared witches, ghosts, pucks, wills of the wisp, werewolves, spirits of the wells and the trees, and all dark, capricious, and harmful beings, whom their fancy called up out of the wild, wet, and unwholesome marshes, or the dark, wolf-haunted woods. For that fair land, like all things on earth, had its dark aspect. The foul exhalations of the autumn called up fever and ague, crippling and enervating and tempting, almost compelling to that wild and desperate drinking which was the Scandinavian special sin. Dark and sad were those short autumn days, when all the distances were shut off, and the air reeked with foul brown fog and drenching rains from the eastern sea, 
and pleasant the bursting forth of the keen northeast wind with all its whirring snowstorms for though it sent men hurrying into the storm to drive the cattle in from the fen and lift the sheep out of the snow wreaths and now and then never to return lost in mist and mire in ice and snow yet all knew that after the snow would come the keen frost and bright sun and cloudless blue sky and the fenman's yearly holiday when work being impossible all gave themselves up to play and swarmed upon the ice on skates and sledges to run races township against township or visit old friends forty miles away and met everywhere faces as bright and ruddy as their own cheered by the keen wind of that dry and bracing frost tumultuously eloquent kingsley gives here an impression which as an overture to the stirring story of Heriwood the wake may not have been guiltless of an anachronism but it suits our purpose the better he is too severe in this case as in others on the roman catholic clergy most likely the gavii were not immigrants from oversea not historical immigrants at any rate their traditions it may well be were of that druidism which the romans understood so little outlaws and desperate men saxon and dane naturally drifted to the fens bringing in their own traditions and became one people with them sledges the denizens of the fens doubtless used and snowshoes perhaps in the days of Heriwood, when the fens were indeed the last stronghold of the english but one would like to see some kind of evidence for skates as for the merrymaking on the ice the friendly visits and the like the chances are that they were as much the products of a happy imagination as the ancient fenman's joy in the wild northeaster life really was hard and lonely for him he probably cursed the northeaster as heartily as a rheumatic man does now and if he welcomed the frost it was because it enabled him to approach and kill the more easily the wild birds with which the fens teemed in the main he was hunter fisher fowler and that was why he resisted civilization junketings on the ice belonged to a later period altogether oliver cromwell resisted the reclamation of the fens because he thought he saw in it a subtle device of the great to enrich themselves the fenman resisted it because he was a fowler and a fisher and the draining reduced the area of his happy hunting grounds and of the waters of which he was free and out of which he could make a scanty living men might call him slodger yellow belly the first word sounds like the very quintessence of churned mud the second is eloquent of sickness and he might grumble at the hardships of his lot still he knew no other way of living he could snare the myriad wildfowl many of them no longer known in england which haunted the fastnesses of the reeds as no other man could he knew the flight of each kind at every hour of the day and at every season of the year no man so cunningly as he could capture the mighty loose or pike noosing him sometimes at others and especially in winter catching him with baits craftily let down through a hole in the ice or could so artfully trap the fat eels wherewith the clergy of ely or of crowland might turn a fast in the letter into a feast in the spirit with his stilts and his leaping pole he could travel over the marshes with the most astonishing celerity 
but that he enjoyed his life so keenly as kingsley would have us believe is in the last degree unlikely still the fenman knew the life and he knew his powers he had no ambition to drive the slow oxen to turn the fertile furrow to garner the golden grain indifferent to questions of national welfare he was as of course the rustic of to-day is absolutely indifferent to considerations of the kind he likes to see the straw so heavy that it cannot be cut by machines laid by storms so that the sickle must needs be employed because that means more work for men time was and that not so very long ago when following the example of the artisans and weavers of manufacturing england hodge rioted and broke up the thrashing machines and the like which did the work of twenty men and more it stands to reason he used to say that such new-fangled notions are bad for the likes of us it stood to reason from the fenman's point of view that to drain the fens would be to leave him without the only occupation for which he was fit it probably never occurred to him that he might adapt himself to altered circumstances and become a regular worker tied to fixed hours instead of an amphibious wanderer fowling and fishing when he pleased or when necessity drove him to exertion who shall blame him certainly not the sportsman the naturalist or the botanist who have felt a pang of regret as they have watched elsewhere than in the fens it may be the marsh that always held snipe from which the bittern has been known to rise in the recesses of which some almost extinct herb survived converted into a fruitful field yet what man familiar with the life of the country has not felt these regrets even while he knew all the time that the change was for the public good and that his own livelihood would not be directly affected is it possible then not to sympathize with the resistance of the fenmen who knew nothing of the public good and saw their livelihood or the chance of obtaining it destroyed before their helpless eyes it was the old story one man's meat is another man's poison all the world over and for all time and there can be no progress no wholesale and beneficial change in the ways of life without much incidental tribulation nevertheless when all things are weighed in the balance not a scintilla of doubt remains that the draining of the fens was begun and continued as the old knight in Heriwood the wake said by the inspiration of god it banished a few birds but we could better spare a few kinds of birds than preserve them with the fevers and the agues which were the inseparable accident of their haunts it was the end of the slodgers and the yellow bellies who were but a handful of men but in their place are thousands of human beings who in spite of agricultural troubles which the drainers of the fens could not by any means have foreseen are at least sufficiently clad and fed and decently housed it is not always it is not indeed often that the reflections appropriate to a scene throng into one's mind when that scene is visited sometimes at the foot of niagara for example thoughts refuse to come into the mind at all it is only afterwards that with dickens one reflects it was surely only afterwards he reflected that the one abiding impression left by niagara is the remembrance from time to time 
that a like mass of water is still falling and falling and falling yesterday today and forever but in relation to the fens i can truthfully say that most of these thoughts ran through my mind as we rolled along the road details of course did not i had forgotten about sir cornelius vermiden and rennie but i remembered the great deeds of the house of bedford and boyhood's delight in Harrowood. as the road followed the sinuous bank of cabined ooze as i looked at the flat fields of rich black soil in which the corn showed green or of pasture springing into life i felt to realize that on these very places the reeds had whispered and as sir bedivere said to king arthur so man might have reported to hereward if you will nought heard i save the waves wap and the waters wan each church with its hamlet rose a little above the general level of the plain making it the easier to understand that each stood on firm ground once an island among the marshes upon which the church had set her beacon light if downham church which we passed might be taken as a sample and it may be with safety then the more leisurely topographers who have gone before are abundantly justified in saying that the churches of the fen country are of an uncommon stateliness and beauty this place by the way shares with north walsham the honour of having taken a share in the education of nelson with such thoughts flooding into the mind we were quickly or seemed to be quickly at ely of which something has been written before and no more shall be written the road thence to cambridge needs no fresh description and at cambridge for our purposes the account of this expedition might end but for one small incident of a doubly instructive character first however let it be said since the bull has been praised before that on this occasion it turned out to have been unhappily chosen as a place at which to take luncheon appetites were ravenous but the meal was not a success perhaps because it was vacation time the house was not prepared for guests at any rate the stair carpets were up but cambridge is a big place on an important highway and in fact the guests were many and the mutton was tough so somewhat dissatisfied to royston and home quite a long way but so far as royston familiar already and beyond that outside the present manor still an incident occurring in the next manor must be recorded because it was an incident because it was germane to the motor car and its little brother the motorcycle and because it had a double moral it so fell out that somewhere between luton and dunstable if memory serves accurately we were proceeding at a fittingly careful pace and keeping scrupulously to the proper side of a not too wide and very meandering road suddenly round the corner in front of us appeared a motorcycle on its proper side of the road too but proceeding at a good pace the motorcyclist having a young woman on a bicycle in tow if she had kept her head all would have been well as it was she lost it fell head over heels into the ditch on her near side of the road and suffered nothing worse than a shaking which indeed she deserved in due course she was picked up placed in the tonneau and taken back to her mother while i held her bicycle as it rested on our near footboard 
it appeared to be the first time this very penitent damsel had tried this suicidal method of progression let us hope it was also the last for that it is suicidal potentially at any rate there is no kind of doubt she was really in some danger for she was just as likely to tumble into the road as into the ditch mr johnson could have stopped in time to avoid her if she had because he was going carefully and with a due regard to the potential dangers of the road but i know a good many other drivers with regard to whom i should be sorry to say confidently that they could be relied upon to have been driving with equal care in the same circumstances it was the kind of incident which made one think end of chapter 12 part 2section twenty seven of through east anglia in a motor car by j e vincent this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter thirteen of through east anglia in a motor car by j e vincent from king's lynn as centre part one practical observations expeditions from king's lynn roads mostly high roads and good hills the early part of the projected drive is through undulating country not marked by very severe gradients the later part from fakenham to swaffham is over ground higher in average elevation but of similar character distances lynn to castle rising four and a quarter miles castle rising to wolferton two miles wolferton to dursingham three miles dursingham to hunstanton eight miles hunstanton to brancaster eight miles brancaster to burnham thorpe four and a half miles burnham thorpe to fakenham twelve miles fakenham to swaffham fifteen and a half miles swaffham to lynn fifteen and a half miles for the purposes of this chapter we will sleep if it please you and take our meals occasionally at the globe hotel standing in the southwest corner of the spacious square at king's lynn where in fact I have often stayed for many days together. That is why the globe is recommended, not with any extremity of warmth, but just as an ordinary and rather old-fashioned hotel, such as one may expect to find. Sometimes the expectation is vain, in a really old-fashioned town like Lynn. It is no sumptuous palace, but it provides plain and wholesome food fair liquor and clean bedrooms at about the normal english price that is much too high of course judged by the continental standard and some day one may hope that the mysterious reason why english hotel keepers having to pay less than the generality of their contemporaries abroad for that raw material of dinners of which they too often forget to change the original condition charge more highly for the results and certainly to all appearance do not thrive so consistently they would answer most likely that the hotel keepers of provincial france and of parts of switzerland can afford to charge their very modest prices because they can safely rely on a regular influx of travellers principally english german and american i can never tell says boniface how many will want dinner on any day whether five come or fifty all expect dinner 
I must always be prepared for them. Very often he is sadly unprepared, and my prices do not do much more than cover my expenses. Many a beautiful joint have I provided, for I never buy anything but the best, that has had to be thrown away. Quote to him hotels abroad, such as we all know, where guests are taken in on pension and fed fairly well at from six to nine francs a day, or put it at five shillings to seven and six to simplify matters, and, while it is plain that he does not really believe you, he will bring up again the same old argument. Nor can you persuade him that a large part of the annual exodus to the continent is due to knowledge that touring in England is, so far as food and accommodation go, so very dear, and often so remarkably nasty by comparison with touring on the continent that men are driven abroad. Individually, however, Boniface is in rather a difficult position. Our beautiful islands, for they are very lovely in many kinds of loveliness, and our roads, which, if not equal to those of France, seem to an American to have attained an almost ideal perfection, will never attract their due share of voluntary travellers until the general average of hotels shall be improved, and the general average of charges shall be reduced. Even then, some years must elapse before the reform would be realised as well as known, and the set habits of the travelling public, the public which travels of its own free will and for its own pleasure, might be slow to change. They also, like the hotel keepers, are Englishmen and English women, Scots and Irish of both sexes, not easy to move out of a fixed groove. In any case, the pioneer, the paragon among hotel keepers, who should attempt to gain custom by setting an example of prices really moderate, not moderate according to English standards, would almost certainly court bankruptcy. One swallow does not make a summer, the certainty of finding one cheap and comfortable hotel on a tour would not suffice to turn the stream of tourists into the route on which that hotel lay. So, perhaps, the complaints of motorists and others concerning the charges of English hotels, and Irish and Scotch hotels too, may be regarded as being rather in the nature of letting off steam than in that of using it in the hope of effecting any real result. The fault lies in the system. The system cannot be reformed without concerted action of hotel keepers, of which there is no present evidence. And, if reform came, the actual reformers would probably be losers, although the next generation of hotel keepers would reap a rich harvest. The process of reform would be, indeed, something like making pasture out of arable land, a costly enterprise, the profits of which are so long in coming that it is rarely undertaken by tenants for a short term. Since that is so, we must take our hotels as we find them, praising some as being a little better than others, when all might be vastly improved. On these principles, the globe at Lynn is recommended, although the crown or the duke's head may, for all I know, be equally good. It may be added, too, that it used to be, perhaps still is, the hotel used by Mr. Thomas Gibson Bowles, whose parliamentary connection with King's Lynn was long. His presence in it, however, argued nothing. 
it may have been the conservative or unionist hotel traditionally as in the royal at norwich is the liberal house or again mr bowles may have been no less independent in the choice of a hotel even in his own constituency than he was in selecting his lobby on a division in the house of commons at any rate the globe will serve as a resting place from it we will examine king's lynn thinking a little of its history and associations and take a drive of a single day in the first part of the chapter and in the second we will take for purposes of writing a considerably longer drive which for those who desire to see a great number of interesting places at leisure would be much better divided into two parts or even three than taken in a single piece only having visited all the places named by road two but not expressly for the purpose of this book i am disposed to recommend a return to lynn for the night if a day seems to be growing too long rather than a sojourn at some outlying place in which the inn or hotel where there is one has not been tested on my vile body for example in this second drive if my advice be taken the traveller may find himself at brancaster at about the time of afternoon tea even on a summer's day he will hardly be disposed to complete the programme suggested he can easily run back to lynn in time to dress for dinner comfortably along a different road from that which he took in coming and if he likes to start again at the next point in the drive on the following morning he can reach that again by a new series of roads he is never likely to regret his return to lynn because it is really an exceedingly interesting and characteristic place it was an old wild fancy that catus decianus bodicea's roman contemporary in this country founded lynn says mr haverfield on the other hand according to the encyclopaedia britannica it is supposed to have been a british settlement its origin is in fact wrop up in mystery rather more completely than is usual with old english towns we know that the earliest entry in the red book of lynn is 1309 and the last east anglian bishop who occupied thetford as his diocesan capital is believed to have built a church where st margaret's now stands presumably therefore lynn was a place of some importance in his day which was at the end of the eleventh and the beginning of the twelfth centuries there is an odd tradition concerning the original church of which not much is left for in the eighteenth century the spire collapsed onto the nave in a gale of wind the tradition mentioned by mr rye is that the foundation was laid on woolpacks but i fancy this only came from some donation of wool or of a wool subsidy in aid of a partial rebuilding whatever it was built on its foundation certainly settled very much directly for the tower leans over in such a pisa-like way that it makes a nervous spectator quite uncomfortable to go inside it and look up though the projecting piers have been there in their present places a trifle over seven hundred years or so how to reconcile this with the fact that the spire was blown down on to the nave in seventeen forty one is mr rye's business not mine besides that the fragments of history connected with lynn are so interesting that they will leave little if any space 
for those discourses on ecclesiastical architecture which are the principal parts of the generality of guide-books of the early history the really early history of lynn little is known it had strong walls relics of which remain of uncertain date save that they were not roman it belonged to the east anglian bishops or at any rate was in their temporal jurisdiction until henry the eighth dissolved the monasteries when it became lynn regis no longer lynn episcopi it was a stopping place for pilgrims on the way to the shrine of our lady of walsingham who were encouraged to lay their offerings in the chapel of the red mount to which chapel very small and very beautiful within an ancient avenue still leads observe the distinct entrance and exit testifying alike to the business aptitude of those who were in charge and to the popularity of the shrine of our lady of walsingham lynn has a charter of twelve sixteen given by king john and preserves a sword and a cup alleged to have been given by him here murray is too clever by half and himself supplies if it had but occurred to him a key which it was left to a local antiquary to apply to this historical problem the cup itself in elegance of shape might have come from the hand of Cellini. the figures in enamel of men and women hunting and hawking are extremely curious judging however from the costume and workmanship this cup cannot be older than the period of edward the third the period of the greatest prosperity of lynn the sword also although an inscription on one side of the hilt records that john took it from his side and gave it to the town is really no older than the sixteenth century both articles seem to be substitutes for the original donations that is not so certain on the opposite page the same writer mentions a brass in st margaret's commemorating a mayor of edward the third's time and a representation below of the peacock's feast given by this same mayor to edward the third who is represented at table having before him a cup very like the one in question now edward the third not only visited lynn but also kept king john of france as an honoured prisoner for many years he was as likely as not to take john with him to lynn and the chances are that the cup as a local antiquary has suggested to mr rye was the gift of a king of france as for the inscription on the sword it is nothing it was in the nature of things that whosoever gave the sword the inscription should be placed upon it afterwards and as to a date suggested by workmanship it would be very unsafe to rely upon it probably it was in the time of edward the third that speaking relatively lynn was most prosperous it is assumed that the statement was not made without evidence of some kind otherwise probabilities would seem to point in the opposite direction and it would be natural to expect that as the fens were gradually subjugated producing some things worth exporting and supporting men capable of buying things imported the port provided for them by nature would grow in respect of trade still there is abundant evidence of its importance later than edward the third and long before the great and good work of reclaiming the fens had been taken seriously in hand in the time of elizabeth lynn and blakeney the latter now no longer worthy of mention as a port furnished two ships and one pinnace 
a contribution equal to that of Ipswich and Harwich to resist the Armada. Then, as we have seen, Oliver Cromwell resisted the first scheme of Fen reclamation formed by the illustrious House of Bedford. The protector of later years was then a resident at Ely and member for Cambridge in the House of Commons. Yet the value of Lynn was quickly made manifest during the rebellion. Moved thereto by stout Sir Hamon Lestrange of Hunstanton, Lynn showed itself to be veritably Lynn Regis, almost the only part of East Anglia that adhered to Charles. It was a matter of no small moment. Even afterwards, when the restoration was being planned, the projected seizure of Lynn was regarded by the planners and by Clarendon as an enterprise of exceptional value, because Lynn was a maritime town of great importance in respect of the situation, and likewise of the good affection of the gentlemen of the parts adjacent. To the first Charles, it would have been of priceless value could he but have held it, for through it he could have secured from the continent that supply of ammunition of which, almost from the beginning of the war, he was in sore need. With Sir Hamon Lestrange for governor, fifty pieces of ordnance, twelve hundred muskets, and five hundred barrels of powder, Lynn was held in a manner plainly showing how much value the king set upon it. The parliamentary generals, however, were equally alive to the use that might be made of Lynn as a port from which to obtain supplies. First Manchester, and later Cromwell, took part in the siege. It is even said the virgin troop of Norwich, Puritan Amazons, took the field on this occasion. At any rate, in 1643, Lynn surrendered, to the grievous loss of Charles and the corresponding gain of the Parliament. Lynn's commercial history may be described roughly as the dogged and not entirely fruitless struggle of a town once really great and prosperous to fight the new conditions of modern trade conditions tending to make remote and out of the way a port which was once accessible and almost central the glory has not all departed but a great deal of it has gone leaving its traces plainly to be seen in architecture the custom house dutch in appearance for the trade with holland was considerable and the guild hall speak of the days gone by the central market square is far too spacious for the present needs of the place the main streets are narrow but that was the way of old cities and their lights carried on elegant iron arches across the streets give it a distinctly foreign air drive away from the main street towards the custom house and you will find another running parallel to it of substantial queen anne houses compelling reflection they speak of a bygone prosperity i have found no trace that lear never was as ipswich and norwich were in the pre-railway days and as for that matter nearly every county town in england was a centre of county society in which the county families kept their town houses occupying them for a gay season in each year these houses seem to speak rather of rich lynn merchants of the past trading with the low countries on a scale very large for those days again with the sea to the northward after a few miles of navigable river and the fens on every side nearly living on its trade by sea lynn seems to have been placed in a species of natural isolation which perhaps goes some way to account for the fact that it is not quite like any other town in england 
probably the lynn character of the past most of us would best like to meet not for very long perhaps was miss mary breeze who died aged seventy eight in seventeen eighty nine it is recorded of her that she took out her shooting license kept as good greyhounds and was as sure a shot as any in the county but a corporation minute beginning guildhall lynn at a congregation there holden on the fourteenth day of february seventeen fifty eight points to a contemporary of miss mary breeze in whom the wider world was once keenly interested on that day eugene aram was approved as usher to the grammar school on the appointment of mr knox in the place of john burke's dismissed like probably most middle-aged men i remember reading eugene aram with eager interest as a boy in these later years the task has been achieved only after heroic efforts and in obedience to a sense of duty the noble author who could describe a chair in front of a public house as cathedrarian accommodation is not for this age by the help however of a paper read by mr e m bellow to a county society and preserved in norfolk and norwich notes and queries i am able to see something of this celebrated case once much discussed as it must have appeared to the inhabitants of lynn aram was appointed usher of the ancient grammar school now vanished in february seventeen fifty eight but lynn has recently acquired a far more important grammar school named after king edward the seventh he lived in the headmaster's house spent his holidays with the vicar of heacham and most of his sundays with archdeacon steadman who was rector of gaywood he was gloomy of aspect given to solitary walks in the habit of looking back over his shoulder as if some one were following him but he was also obviously a man of remarkable attainments bulwer gives him all these traits except i think that of looking over his shoulder which is local tradition bulwer also makes aram the impassioned suitor of a local lady but mr bellow says nothing on that head if aram was such then his intentions must have been dishonourable and may have been bigamous on that point however lynn could have known nothing imagine then the surprise of the good people of lynn when in august or september of the year seventeen fifty eight after aram had been among them seven months only two knaresborough constables came to sir john turner the most important magistrate of lynn and one of those who had sanctioned the appointment of aram with a warrant against the usher the warrant being issued in yorkshire required to be backed sir john turner backed it accompanied the constables to the grammar school and was present while aram having been summoned to an inner room was duly arrested next according to hood's dream of eugene aram two stern-faced men set out from lynn through the cold and heavy mist and eugene aram walked between with gyves upon his wrist this was poetic license as a matter of fact aram started for knaresborough in a post-chaise that was all the people of lynn saw or knew of eugene aram save that they learned through the meagre channels of information then existing that he was eventually convicted at knaresborough after lying untried for nearly a year in york jail on a charge of murder fourteen years old small wonder then that mr bellow wrote and read aloud his name has been from my youth upwards a kind of fascination for me 
small wonder that lynn was and remained deeply interested to find it had harboured a criminal whose guilt was doubted by some whose career was the theme of a stirring poem nobly recited by sir henry irving and of a novel which was at one time much to the taste of the age eugene aram's story is really so full of interest that it is worth summarising very briefly and without introduction of the love interest as his literary agents have it with which bulwer strove to give it human reality of quite humble parentage and meagre education he early showed a passion for learning born in seventeen o four he was a married schoolmaster at netherdale long before he was thirty and when he migrated to knaresborough still as a schoolmaster in seventeen thirty four he had acquired considerable knowledge of latin and greek at knaresborough he remained ten years then his intimate daniel clark disappeared having previously been supplied with a large quantity of goods on credit. Nothing worse than a common swindle seems to have been suspected at the time. Suspicion of having been concerned in it fell upon Aram. Proceedings were taken against him. His garden was searched, but no evidence was forthcoming, and he was discharged. However, he left Knaresborough shortly afterwards, deserting his wife at the same time, and for the next ten years he appears to have wandered about England, acting as usher in all sorts of schools, and studying comparative philology. The definite story finds him next an usher at Lynn, peculiar in manner, but, by reason of his attainments probably, an acceptable associate to the cultivated gentleman of the district. It would have been well for Aram if, when he left Knaresborough, he had taken away his wife also. The deserted woman, whom the noble novelist found it convenient to forget, had doubtless a feeling of resentment against her husband, and had certainly a long tongue talking over her grievances which really were quite considerable she had been heard to suggest that her husband and houseman the scoundrel houseman of bulwer were jointly responsible for the disappearance of clark but her talk was clearly regarded as the scurrilous spite of an angry woman then a skeleton was found near knaresborough in a place where no recent skeleton had a right to be and folks began to say that there was some method in mrs aram's madness there was an inquest at which she gave evidence houseman was arrested and confronted with the bones he vowed that they were not the bones of dan clark confessed that he had been present while Aram and another man murdered Clark, and that Clark's bones had been buried in a well-known cave hard by. In that cave, bones were found. Where was Aram? A clue, this is from Mr. Bellow, and does not appear in most accounts, was supplied by a Yorkshire horse-dealer, who had seen Aram at Lynn during his travels so aram was arrested as we have seen tried convicted and executed making full confession after conviction and suggesting by way of motive that clark had made too successful love to his wife was eugene aram guilty or not to his confession probably no serious attention need be paid the man was highly strung clearly he had been a penniless prisoner for nearly a year at a time when our prisons were hells upon earth he had conducted his own defence during an arduous and from our modern point of view very unfairly conducted trial 
he attempted suicide by opening a vein on the night before his execution. He was desperate, probably not master of himself, and last, perhaps not least, confessions were the custom of the criminals of the age. It has been urged on his behalf that the trial was unfair, from our point of view, since counsel might not be retained for the defence of prisoners in those days, nor wives called in defence of their husbands. As to the wife's evidence, if it had been admissible, the story makes it plain that it would have been more likely to be damning than favourable. She had been deserted. She had been left to shift for herself for many years. She had said that Aram knew all about the disappearance of Clark. It was a distinct advantage to Aram that she could not be called. That he suffered from having to defend himself is in the last degree unlikely. Paley, who travelled all the way from Cambridge to hear his defence, said he had secured his conviction by his own cleverness. The original defence, preserved by Bulwer, is indeed marked by singular ability, but it is not in the very least convincing. I can imagine the jury saying to one another, if this obviously clever man can think of nothing better than this to say, he is guilty, sure enough. Houseman, it might very fairly be said, was not a credible witness. He was, indeed, on his own showing, a most mean and despicable villain. But the strength of the circumstantial evidence, the fact that Aram ran away, that he did not cross-examine Houseman or attempt to overthrow his evidence, and that his defence really amounted to an essay on the fallibility of circumstantial evidence, were quite enough to secure his conviction then or now. The sympathy felt for Eugene Aram has sprung from the fact that the villain Houseman escaped, and that Aram was an able and a brilliantly learned man. Hume, I believe, said he was a century ahead of his age in Celtic research, but neither the one fact nor the other is inconsistent with a belief that Clark was murdered, and that Aram was present at the murder. Such are the reflections one may carry about the narrow streets of Lynn, and sometimes, of an evening, one may go to the theatre, but my one experience of that was not inviting. The maxim, ne coram populo, was more flagrantly trodden underfoot, surely, than ever before, when, in a play called, I think, Slaves of the Harem, a full-blooded and genuine African went through with a bowstring, the gestures of executing an erring lady on the stage, who in her turn made appropriate grimaces, to the uproarious delight of an audience which insisted on encoring the scene. On the other hand, time spent in talking with the people in warm bar parlours of an evening, or among the mariners who idle on the quay by day, as mariners always have, and always will, is apt to be rewarded by no means ill. Among the seafaring men, at any rate, hardy fishermen for the most part, the feeling that one may be talking to lineal descendants of Vikings soon deepens into conviction. They are fine seamen too, these men of the East Coast, and the Navy depends upon them not a little but very prudently, and without saying anything about it, it is arranged that the same ship's company shall never be part east and part west countrymen. It was foreordained that this portion of a chapter should end with a drive. It is a drive to be taken very shortly in print, and quite easily by road over Fen country, not needing to be described anew, 
to a cathedral city situate geographically in the midlands that is to say to peterborough now peterborough is in northamptonshire and northamptonshire sounds midland as midland can be on what pretext is peterborough introduced really none is needed our brief detour is but an illustration of the truth that county boundaries apart from the matters of police and road-making have no more meaning for the motorist than they had for the romans peterborough is easily accessible from lynn via wisbeach by thirty-five miles of flat road its cathedral dominates the fens from the west as Ely dominates their southern and central parts. It has been intimately associated with their troubled history in the past. The cathedral too, although by no means to be reckoned amongst the most majestic to be found in England, is very fine in itself, and exceptionally interesting and suggestive. I had written instructive, but that is usually a word raising expectation of tedious discourse. As a matter of fact, little shall be written about Peterborough Cathedral, although many personal impressions might be moulded into one. Go to see Peterborough Cathedral. Remember that it is one of the three Norman cathedrals of England, that the first church on this site was built in the closing years of the seventh century and raised to the ground by the danes that the second was burned in the twelfth century that the greater part of the present structure was one hundred and twenty years in the building before it was consecrated in the thirteenth century that the central tower was rebuilt in the fourteenth century and that the nineteenth century saw a great deal of necessary work done remembering this you will surely depart reluctantly convinced that of all our english books in stone none contains more chapters than that entitled peterborough cathedral that in no edifice can the student of architecture who inspects with the advantage of special knowledge or the fairly cultivated man who lacks that special knowledge find more details of genuine charm and interest here you can trace developments early norman vaulting in the aisles exquisite fan vaulting it is peculiar to england in the choir clustered piers to columns here you may follow the differences in character and arrangement between a monastic cathedral such as peterborough was served by regular clergy and monks and one of the old foundation like st paul's which being served by secular clergy was not affected by the reforms of henry the eighth you may see too traces of the iconoclastic zeal of cromwell's followers often credited with the misdeeds of others in spite of them too you may realize not more forcibly than elsewhere perhaps but still in full force that which has been remarkably well put by professor bannister fletcher and mr bannister f fletcher in their comparative architecture the place in the national life which the medieval cathedrals occupied was an important one and must be realized if we would understand how they were regarded in the absence of books and of people able to read them cathedrals were erected and decorated partly as a means of popular education the sculpture and the painted glass reflecting the incidents of bible history from the creation to the redemption of mankind the sculptured forms and brilliant colouring rendering them easily understood by the people the virtues and vices with their symbols were also displayed either in glass or statuary along with their reward or punishment 
saints and angels told of the better life and the various handicrafts both of peace and war were mirrored in imperishable stone or coloured glass they to a large extent took the place in our social state since occupied by such modern institutions as the board school free library museum picture gallery and concert hall they were the history books of the period architecture then as now was also the grand chronicle of secular history past and present in which kings nobles and knights were represented nothing conduces more to appreciation of the full meaning of a passage than the laborious process of copying and having now performed that process i am moved to protest that these few lines while they leave to the understanding the purely ecclesiastical significance of medieval architecture and are absolutely free from rhetorical artifice are more pregnant with meaning than many pages of moving eloquence so we leave peterborough and if the mood seizes us make a detour of eight miles to crowland before returning to peterborough this personally i cannot speak for but there are some remains of the historic abbey End of chapter 13 part 1section twenty eight of through east anglia in a motor car by j e vincent this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter thirteen of through east anglia in a motor car by j e vincent from king's lynn as centre part two the end of these wanderings is now close in sight and the thought fills him who writes with feelings in which regret predominates over relief he would be a cold-blooded person indeed who after much travel in east anglia had revealed to him many beauties new to him besides refreshing acquaintance with those seen before after steeping himself to the best of his ability and opportunities in the history and legends of the district should not have developed a very warm appreciation of the variety and character of both but it is needless to say this over and over again in various forms of words in vain imitation of matthew arnold's method of compelling attention and there is the less excuse for anything of the kind in that our last drive or drives take us through an exceptionally large number of storied places and through some of the most breezy and fascinating of norfolk scenery we will begin if you please by going to castle rising lying three and a half miles nor nor east of lynn and there we must stop for quite a long time despite the local saying rising was a seaport town when lynn was but a marsh there is a good deal of doubt about its early history concerning its later history there is none at all the sand just silted up the harbour the port became a mere memory and of all the rotten boroughs disenfranchised by the reform act of eighteen thirty two none perished more deservedly than castle rising where the voters were reduced to two was it of castle rising it was certainly of some rotten borough in east anglia that i read how the nobleman who kept it in his pocket mockingly caused a waiter to represent it in parliament it was in the days at any rate when a waiter as a member of the best club in the world 
would have seemed a great deal more out of place than he would in these days of sectional representation let us consider first what there is to see over a bridge and through a norman gatehouse one enters an almost circular space surrounded by a very high earth bank and a deep ditch inside the commanding object is the keep its norman windows full of character its walls nine feet thick the chapel and part of the constable's lodgings also remain the hall and gallery remain in part everything else is utterly perished still rising is an impressive monument of the olden time how long have the earthworks occupied their present position at one period antiquaries of repute placed a roman camp here calling some of the earthworks roman but writes mr haverfield this is most unlikely and no roman remains have ever been found here it is true a coin of constantine the great was once dug up in the neighbourhood but this would be vague at best and one coin goes no further as an argument of a roman camp than a sixpence dropped by an explorer does to prove a british settlement in the heart of tibet mound and ditch may have been british but there is no suggestion of evidence to prove it they are not in the least likely to have been roman for the romans had little if any fighting in these parts and the defence of this portion of the saxon shore was as we shall see shortly provided for by the fortification of brancaster after all why should not william dalbini first earl of arundel who at any rate began the building of the castle have caused the mound to be heaped up and the ditch scooped out in the closing years of the twelfth century it was a period when norman nobles were not unduly particular as to the manner in which they extorted work and it may well have seemed to him desirable to make a position naturally strong all but impregnable the most interesting of the early lords was robert de montal who had a feud and a lawsuit with the people of lynn lynn it is pretty clear had ceased to be a marsh by that time and the two communities were far too adjacent to one another for friendly feeling to subsist de montal too claimed certain rights in connection with the tollbooth and tolls of lynn which were not to the taste of the free and independent burghers of lynn it so fell out that one day de montal and his followers were in lynn when they were espied by the burghers thereupon nicholas de northampton and others raised the town against them chased them to his dwelling-house surely hardly castle rising besieged it broke open the doors beat him and his men stripped them of weapons money and jewels to the value of forty pounds kept him in durance for two days and released him only upon his solemn promise in the market-place to relinquish all actions against the mayor and all claims against the corporation de montal made his promise and departed but he certainly did not keep the spirit of the compact extorted from him by duress for he had the law of the corporation of lynn secured judgment for six thousand pounds a huge sum in those days and more than that he actually got four thousand pounds for which he compromised and lynn was taxed for years to pay the money by instalments of a surety robert de montal laughed best over that quarrel 
in the case of the next and for our purposes the last inmate of castle rising we have an illustration of the troublesome manner in which industrious diggers after facts destroy established and easily assimilated statements by historians in the case of isabella the she-wolf of france whose paramour mortimer had caused her husband edward the second to be murdered with unexampled barbarity in berkeley castle it was nice and easy to learn that after the accession of edward the third and the fall and execution of mortimer the queen mother was deprived of her enormous jointure and shut up in the castle of rising where she spent the remaining twenty-seven years of her life in obscurity if ever there was a thoroughly bad woman that woman was isabella and to dispose of her in a single sentence was nice and simple unhappily it seems like the story of alfred's cakes and other cherished traditions to be entirely wrong while isabella was at rising edward allowed her three thousand a year first and four thousand a year later letters patent under her hand were issued from her castle of hartford in the twentieth year of edward the third edward the third visited her often at castle rising she was allowed to make a pilgrimage to walsingham which after all was quite near she visited norwich with edward the third and his queen in thirteen forty four and she died at hartford castle having been there since thirteen fifty seven in fact neither the sufferings nor the obscurity of the she-wolf of france were of a striking character inland from castle rising you may see a ridge of upland pine and heather clad with here and there some woodland and some agricultural land following the line of the coast but three or four miles from it your best route will be to travel some three miles to wolferton along a level and excellent road the roads of norfolk are indeed good throughout in my experience at wolferton you can hardly fail to notice the peculiar stone of a dark reddish brown colour of which the church is built it is called car stone locally a great deal of it is used in cottages houses and churches and if it seems a trifle redder to you at wolferton than elsewhere it never so struck me the redness is attributable to a fire of fourteen eighty six after which a license to collect alms for rebuilding was issued if such licenses were a condition precedent to similar collections now the post office would be much the poorer and some of us might be richer what must also strike the spectator from the road is the very stately tower and by entering you will see a fine specimen of the not too common hammer beam roof from wolferton to sandringham or to its gates i have walked and driven at almost every season of the year always to find fresh beauties in that gentle slope in winter with snow upon the ground when its fresh green is on the larches in spring when bracken is pushing out its fronds in embryo knots when the heather is in its glory and best of all when the rhododendrons are in bloom it is as beautiful a sight as any upon which the eye of man need desire to rest moreover this stretch of the heathlands of east anglia looks the very place for any roving bird to haunt and it is a real bond of union between me and the artist who gives to these pages more than half their brightness to learn from him that the sheldrake nests here habitually 
at the top of the hill on the right you obtain a glimpse of the parish church of sandringham modern and regularly attended by the king and queen and of the park across which the king walks to service for all the world like any other country gentleman a hundred yards or so farther on you are opposite the principal gates these are of exquisite ironwork and were presented to the then prince of wales in 1864 by the county of norfolk justly proud of its newly acquired landowner and entitled to be proud too of the workmanship which turned these gates out at norwich now sandringham is not a place that is shown on stated days as many houses are it is too small for that it is indeed one of the few places where the king and queen can enjoy real privacy but as luck will have it i have seen sandringham inside and a brief impression of it is given partly perhaps because it may be welcome from a careful witness but mainly because mr walter rye has done it injustice sandringham itself he wrote in eighteen eighty five is nothing much to see it was bought vastly dear and has had a tremendous lot of money spent on it gunton or blickling would have been much more suited to him and with the same amount of money spent on them would by this time have been little palaces very likely but the prince of wales as he was then desired not a palace but a home in which he could live during his all too rare holidays from public duty the life of a country gentleman with his family in which he could interest himself in farming and could enjoy really good shooting in which his princess could indulge her taste for gardening and for keeping dogs of many kinds in which last and best of all his children could lead simple lives and be much in the open air all that he found in sandringham the situation is pretty and remarkably healthy the shooting is of the best and full variety the gardens reveal the taste of their royal mistress the house is full of dear memories and of rare possessions it may not be very beautiful architecturally but it is essentially a house to be lived in and it is something in its favour that in an age which believes in the health-giving power of the sun it is absolutely suffused with all the light there is of a truth mr rye's sympathy is quite uncalled for and even rather needlessly offensive by the way as you pass you may chance to hear a sandringham clock strike twelve and find that your impeccable watch only admits half past eleven and you may remember to have seen in some of the papers at various times that it is the king's hobby to have all his clocks half an hour fast so that he may never be late it is his hobby but its object is not to secure punctuality so much as to cheat the morning out of an extra half hour the evening hours can be prolonged at pleasure but to start shooting at nine thirty instead of ten on a winter's day is a great gain blickling it should be added is near aylsham it was owned once by harold then by the bishops of norwich and then by sir thomas bolin father of anne bolin a sheet of water about a mile long in the middle of a beautiful and well wooded park is a fitting adjunct to the noble red house built in the reign of james i with its fine sealed galleries and carvings and its grand staircase so mr rye and then he passes off to heraldry gunton is 
or was in the same neighbourhood murray says that the house of white brick enlarged by wyatt 1785 neither statement sounds alluring is without interest mr rye says elsewhere the hall was burnt out not long ago he writes in 1885 and is not yet rebuilt and very picturesque it looks with its great gaunt shell pierced by rows of empty windows it would make a capital ruin and might just as well be left as it is and a smaller house more suitable to the fortunes of the harbours built elsewhere in the park shooting and motoring are the great outdoor occupations of sandringham if the king be at home the chances of seeing a royal car on these roads are many and in late november you may often hear the guns popping like a feu de jouie nay on the road which turns sharply to the left for dursingham by the gate proceeding through fine trees on both sides and on the level for a while and then down a steep hill i have had the good fortune to see the prince of wales and the german emperor bringing pheasants down in a manner more than workmanlike so to dursingham a sunny village lying in a cup of the modest little hills here again you will be struck by the all-pervading use of the local cast stone very neatly dressed in minute blocks apparently impervious to weather and incapable of taking any tone from rain and wind and sun picturesque to the eye of a stranger it certainly is not but the walls and houses built of it are trim to a dutch point of neatness and to accustomed eyes it no doubt seems to be part of the established order of things it is no harm suggesting again that in relation to the appearance of things the product of man's hand of the operations of nature or of the two combined first impressions are not to be trusted in all cases custom makes a world of difference a chinaman or a hottentot has for example ideas completely opposite to ours concerning female beauty without yielding to either in the matter of opinion even in these extreme instances we may possibly concede that standards of beauty are not to be defined with scientific precision car stone buildings to some of us may look a trifle grim and formal although their ferruginous tone is not cold at worst they represent the resolve to use local material which is usually consonant with art and sense and no doubt their appearance excites no feeling of distaste in the people of norfolk who after all are the persons principally concerned of this same stone the church is built here the passers-by will be struck by the stately proportions of the lofty tower and if he enters he will notice the orderly condition of all things as well as a piscina and a hagioscope to the neat condition of things which should be normal attention is called in this case because apparently it is the complete opposite of the state of things prevailing in the early seventies when everything capable of suffering from neglect had so suffered dursingham is a pleasantly tidy village but not model in the artificial sense it boasts a hotel the feathers where i stayed for a week a good many years ago it was then one of the worst in england but in new hands it is understood to be better on the whole however dursingham is not recommended for a sojourn nor has it in all probability 
been encouraged to lay itself out to attract visitors. From Dursingham to the Hunstantons is a pleasant drive of some six miles, calling for no particular comment at any point save Snettisham, where the position of the church, embowered in trees, fascinates the eye. The Hunstantons has been written because there are two communities, the old and the new, whereof the latter, according to Mr. Rye, preemptorily refuses to be dubbed St. Edmund's, in spite of the tradition that a ruined chapel near the lighthouse on the cliff commemorates the landing place of St. Edmund. It is rather an even question whether the Hunstantons owe most to the cliff, which is their chief glory, or to the Lestrangers, who have done all that was possible for their prosperity. How long they have been in the land, being no genealogists, I do not profess to say. They are not included in Mr. Rye's list of grantees from William the Conqueror, but the monument of Henry Lestrange and his wife, dated 1485, to be found in the church, is ancient enough to be at least respectable, and his epitaph is worth quoting at once, although we shall soon refer to earlier members of the race. In heaven at home, O blessed change, who, while I was on earth, was strange. Never were a countryside and a great family connected more consistently to the benefit of the first and to the honour of the second. Hard by the church is the ancient Twithill, according to one of the authorities, the place of assembly. Since the survival of this expression is by no means frequent, it may perhaps be permissible to remark that, if the eye will travel across the map of England, due west from Hunstanton, and as far as it can go, it will come to another Twithill, at Carnarvon. The spelling looks British, and the ancient British borrowed a good many words direct from the Latin. Fenstra, for example, from Fenestra, for window, doubtless a new idea to them. So, being expert neither in philology nor Anglo-Saxon, but well aware that the Saxons never penetrated to Carnarvon, and that both Twithills are remarkably good places of observation, I hazard the suggestion that the letters TWT at the beginning of the word Twithills is a British equivalent of Twitus from Twera, of which the proper meaning is to gaze, that they were, in fact, lookouts. A coincidence in the history of the Church of St. Mary, probably unique, is that it was built by Sir Hamon Lestrange and his son early in the 14th century, and restored in good taste by a Lestrange of the 20th century. Whether the places owe most to the family, or the family to the places, is not easy to decide. But certainly no family ever did its duty more consistently by any countryside. On the other hand, but for the curious cliff, itself remarkably attractive for its outlines and colouring, the Hunstantons could not have existed to be cherished by the Lestrangers, for there is still abundant evidence of a submerged forest between Old Hunstanton and Brancaster. The cliff it was to the sea. Thus far shalt thou go, and no further. The cliff it is that allows the Lestrangers to live in the ancient hall, 15th century and moated, and to play the part of a human providence in this most remote corner of Norfolk. Of the part they played for Charles I, mention has been made before. Eight miles along the coast, 
take us to Brancaster and to history, lately made far less obscure than it used to be. Here, it is clearly the best course to quote Mr. Haverfield's description, because it is far and away the best, having first summarised a little of the information leading up to it. Mention has been made of the Pedder's or Peddler's Way, traceable not very distinctly for the first six miles, but quite plainly afterwards from Holm, midway between Brancaster and Old Hunstanton, through Fring, Castle Acre, Swaffham, and other places to the boundary of Suffolk and beyond. The difficulty that it did not lead to Brancaster further complicated by the fact that there was no obvious reason why it should not, was the origin of a theory that it might have led to a ferry from Holm to Skegness. But the passage would involve some twenty miles of nasty navigation. Even an antiquary, when it came to the test of trial, would shrink from such a trajectus there must have been a road to Brancaster. There is no trace of any other. It was certainly Roman. It was probably military. That is Mr. Haverfield's conclusion. And, as a slayer of mere fancies, he is so just and relentless that, when at all positive, he is the more convincing. Garrisons in Roman times were on the north and west, beyond the Severn and Humber, where they were needed, but by about 300 AD, Saxon pirates began to harry the eastern and southern coasts, as they continued to do almost up to the Norman conquest. So a series of nine forts, of which Branodunum, or Brancaster, was one, was constructed to defend the threatened coast from this point to Pevensey in far Sussex. At Brancaster lay the Dalmatian cavalry, keeping an eye on the wash and the little harbours and creeks to the westward. The site of Branodunum is at the Wreck or Rack Hill, a short distance to the east of Brancaster village, between the high road and the creek which forms the western arm of Brancaster Harbour. It is still distinguishable by the fragments of brick and pottery which lie about it, and by the slight but perceptible elevation of its area. But its walls and buildings have long ago vanished, and little of them seems to have been visible even in Camden's days. In size and outline, the fort is stated to have been a square of 570 feet, that is, seven and a half acres, with gateways on the eastern and western sides. But no precise measurements have ever been secured, and I am inclined to consider these figures as somewhat too small. Excavations made in 1846 showed that the northeast angle of the fort was rounded and had within it a small rectangular guard chamber or turret and presumably the three other angles were similar at the same time it was found that the walls were eleven feet thick constructed of concrete and built with facing and bonding courses of a local white sandstone at the eastern gate which apparently had flanking bastions, a road 33 feet wide was found to enter the fort and run 360 feet across it westwards. Some slight indications of structures within the fort were also noted, but much yet remains to be explored. This is Mr. Haverfield's constant plea in relation to East Anglian remains, and there is much to be said in favour of it. There is neither sense nor reason in standing outside earth mounds, or in trying to guess their contents, when the spade would reveal them if they existed, 
and a nation which expends so much as ours does in digging up ruins abroad might very well do much more work of the same kind at home the spade for example might resolve the question whether caster by yarmouth and Reedham were forts or not but at present their character is quite uncertain and the nearest fort to brancaster we know is borough castle by yarmouth so much at least we know definitely of brancaster and it can hardly fail to grasp the imagination here at this extreme northeast point of norfolk the dalmatian cavalry men of the same blood as constantine the great watched the sea against the enemies of rome taking the comparative conditions of travel into account it was almost as it would be if we placed a regiment of sikhs in new zealand to guard it against possible raids from the islands of the pacific End of chapter 13 part 2section twenty nine of through east anglia in a motor car by j e vincent this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter thirteen of through east anglia in a motor car by j e vincent from king's lynn as centre part three beyond brancaster we follow the coast as far as burnham deepdale the brook in these parts is responsible for many a place name and for one of undying fame and then leave the coast willingly enough for the sandy waste of the mells soon ceases if indeed it ever begins to attract then the aspect of the country soon loses its bleak and wind-swept character we are in a peaceful land of little hills and many woods of brooks and verdure at burnham thorpe in particular we are in the village to one of whose sons england and the world owe at least as much as they do to any other hero of history here nelson was born those four words imply volumes but they are volumes which positively must not be so much as begun because they would never end and they would be familiar from the first page to the last here son of a father who was but a country clergyman and of a mother of the pure and ancient blood of norfolk lived the boy who grew into the man whose every virtue and every failing are known of all men he did not live here long he was at school at north walsham and at downham and he joined the raisonable at chatham when he was but twelve and a half years of age but he never forgot his birthplace and it was named conjointly with the nile when he was most justly raised to the peerage one of the most tranquil spots in the world and very lovely is burnham thorpe and it is holy ground not long since on a pleasure voyage round the extreme north of scotland a perfervid scot was heard to proclaim the glorious deeds done for the empire by scotland's sons a west countryman retorted but for devon you would all have been spaniards an east anglian might have chimed in with burnham thorpe an irishman with the birthplace of the duke of wellington and it would all go simply to show how futile it is to institute comparisons possibly at brancaster possibly at burnham thorpe the suggestion of a return to lynn for the night may have been taken in that case it is advised that the return journey of the morning be made to fakenham only taking rainham park by the way here 
in print we merely drive to fakenham through pleasantly undulating and well wooded country on the west side of walsingham and houghton which we know of fakenham too something has been said before but a remark worth making in passing because it happens to be true is that fakenham norfolk was an address often used by me as a boy desirous of acquiring ferrets or spaniels of miraculous quality according to the advertisement the explanation is plain on the face of the land to him who travels this country it is very largely and successfully devoted to game but whether the vendors of these animals all paragons in their kind were entitled to use the ground on and under which they had trained them may be an open question my recollections of rainham hall are so ancient the circumstances in which they were acquired were so peculiar and my ignorance is so complete upon the questions whether the famous pictures are still there and whether the hall is ever open to visitors that i am not in a position to say whether it is worth while to go three and a quarter miles out of the way to it it may be taken that it is if it be possible only to see the park and the outside of the house for the latter is by inigo jones and vastly fine and the park containing a magnificent sheet of water famous for its pike is delightful of the modern representatives of this ancient and once distinguished family it were unkind to speak some of the earlier stock were distinguished one took a prominent part for the king in the rebellion and in the restoration to another the famous belisarius was given by frederick the great a third introduced the turnip into norfolk and was jested at by pope but pope is not so quotable as a more enthusiastic and less known verse-maker of norfolk thus townsend gave the master key to unlock the store of husbandry who like triptolemus of old from clods made rustics gather gold friend patriarchal to our county still as we taste we own thy bounty one of the great main roads of norfolk starts from cromer and runs through sheringham and several other places to elmham and east Dereham. whether you start from fakenham or rainham you join it by a cross-road just north of twyford and a norfolk main road is always worth joining because it is so good to travel upon to elmham it is positively necessary to go it was in all probability the seat of east anglian bishops before they deserted it for thetford and then for norwich certainly they had their palace there and the earthworks are the more rather than the less interesting in that they are according to the authority more than once quoted probably post-roman it is worth while to enter the church too not merely to see the carved bench heads which are quite common in norfolk but because one of them of a roman in a helmet is said to represent pontius pilate a short five miles takes us to east Dereham, and it has been described by a master's hand i have already said that it was a beautiful little town at least it was at the time of which i am speaking what it is at present i know not for thirty years and more have elapsed since i last trod its streets of a truth it seems to have changed very little it will scarcely have improved for how could it be better than it then was i love to think on thee pretty quiet d 
thou pattern of an english country town with thy clean but narrow streets branching out from thy modest market-place with thine old-fashioned houses with here and there a roof of venerable thatch with thy one half aristocratic mansion where resided lady bountiful she the generous and kind who loved to visit the sick leaning on her gold-headed cane whilst the sleek old footman walked at a respectful distance behind pretty quiet d with thy venerable church in which moulder the remains of england's sweetest and most pious bard the bard of course was cowper who lived at east Dereham in his affliction died and was buried there to be perfectly candid it is in the nature of a relief to one who has found the works of cowper always excepting john gilpin sweet and pious but also a trifle tiresome to convert to his own use the usual word for taking a loan is clearly barred some panegyric of cowper from george borrow who was unlike to cowper as one man can be to another and not from some more modern writer making a business of admiration borrow indeed proceeds in a tone of heartfelt sympathy which none of the professional eulogists can touch it was within thee that the long oppressed bosom heaved its last sigh and the crushed and gentle spirit escaped from a world in which it had known naught but sorrow sorrow do i say how faint a word to express the misery of that bruised reed misery so dark that a blind worm like myself is occasionally tempted to exclaim better had the world never been created than that one so kind so harmless and so mild should have undergone such intolerable woe but it is over now for as there is an end of joy so has affliction its termination doubtless the all-wise did not afflict him without a cause who knows but within that unhappy frame lurked vicious seeds which the sunbeams of joy and prosperity might have called into life and vigour perhaps the withering blasts of misery nipped that which otherwise might have terminated in fruit noxious and lamentable but peace to the unhappy one he is gone to his rest the death-like face is no longer occasionally seen timidly and mournfully looking for a moment through the window-pane upon thy market-place quiet and pretty d the hind in thy neighbourhood no longer at evening fall views and starts as he views the dark lathy figure moving beneath the hazels and the elders of shadowy lanes or by the side of murmuring trout streams and no longer at early dawn does the sexton of the old church reverently doff his hat as supported by some kind friend the death-stricken creature totters along the church path to that mouldering edifice with the low roof enclosing a spring of sanitary waters built and devoted to some saint if the legend over the door be true by the daughter of an east anglian king well the daughter of the east anglian king was withburger and the name of her father who reigned in the seventh century appears to have been anna she was a sister of st ethelreda too but the pilgrimage to east Dereham is better worth taking for the love of george borrow than for the sake of any saint female or male seventh or seventeenth century george borrow was assuredly no saint but a wanderer an adventurer a wayward genius a very human and fallible man with 
a true English heart, to quote Mr. Augustine Birrell. At East Dereham he was born. From East Dereham he drew Philo, the clerk to the life, on the East Anglian heaths he met, and studied the gypsies whom he knew as no other Englishman amongst us has ever known them. He belongs to East Dereham. He is its veritable Vartes Sarcha. East Dereham is the intersecting point of two great roads, the one we came by, which goes on to Thetford and Bury, and the road crossing the county from Norwich to Lynn. That will give us a straight run home, for Lynn is home for the nonce by way of Swaffham, where we must make a detour for Castle Acre. Swaffham itself is of little apparent interest, although its church is worth more than a passing glance, since it is a good type of Norfolk church, and can boast a double hammer-beam roof. But Swaffham interests me, and is likely to interest a good many other persons, in a connection with matters more mundane. So early as the first chapter, when we were passing near to another Swaffham, multiplicity of identical place names exceeds the limits of convenience in East Anglia, a casual observation was made to another Swaffham, the one at which we now are, where George, Earl of Orford, founded the first coursing club ever started in England, and I thought, as I wrote, of an ancient manuscript, commonplace book, in which a young Welsh parson, breeder of greyhounds and runner of them, commemorated the mighty achievements of greyhounds in East Anglia. Since then, we have encountered George, Earl of Orford, have felt, perhaps, a little more sympathy with him than the world, which knows him only as a seller of priceless pictures. Since then, too, I have laid my hand on the book, and in it is a long note headed, October 1792, Swaffham Coursing Society. A cup, value 25 guineas, subscribed for in honour to the memory of the founder, George, Earl of Orford, to be run for in November annually, upon the following terms and conditions. To give these in full, might try patience too hard, but the foundation of the cup, in itself, shows that the eccentric peer was not ill-liked in his county, and some of the rules are so quaint that the whole may be condensed. If entries are more than sixteen, or less than sixteen in number, they are to be reduced to sixteen or eight, as the case may be, by lot. If any of the matched dogs should be so disabled as to pay forfeit to his antagonist, that antagonist shall be deemed the winner of the heat in question but the person paying forfeit shall produce another dog to run a course against him, which substituted dog shall have no chance for the cup, even if he wins his heat. It is provided also that no owner may enter more than one dog, that entries shall be a guinea, and that each owner shall back his dog for a guinea in each heat. Venues are then laid down, Westacre for the first dog, Smeefield for the second, Narborough for the third, and Westacre for the final. The club, a later note informs us, was limited to the number of letters in the alphabet, applicants for vacancies as they occurred to be balloted for. It is interesting to think of the scenes on Westacre and the other manors, some certainly retaining their ancient names still, in 1792, when coursing, now fallen on evil days, was fashionable. To recall the names of those who were present is not possible, 
for 1792 was the date of the birth of the writer of the commonplace book, and his copy of the rules was apparently made in a mood of research into the antiquities of his favourite sport. But I find a list of courses at Swaffham, 1825, clearly showing by the letters appended to the names that the old limitation to the letters of the alphabet survived, and the names themselves may stir East Anglian memories. They are Mr. Keppel, K, Mr. Tyser, F, Mr. H. Hammond, Q, Mr. Gurney, A, Mr. Den, D, Mr. Redhead, L, Mr. Ayton, P, Mr. Carter, G, Lord Dunnage, M, Lord Stradbrook, E, Mr. Buckworth, B, Mr. Young, V, Mr. Gurdon, S. Members of the Yorkshire, Wiltshire and Berkshire coursing clubs were also at liberty to enter for the Orford Cup. From Swaffham we make a detour of four and a half miles to Castle Acre, and to the mystery of earthworks. It is the last place we visit in East Anglia, and having visited it, it will be just as well to return to the good high road for our return journey to Lynn. What one sees after a drive across the gorse-clad common is simple, what it means is another matter. One sees the ruins of the priory, a great mound, and beyond it a village showing what has become of the ruins of the castle and the priory. The story of the castle is easily traced with the help of Messrs. Timms and Gunn. The site was granted by the conqueror to William de Warren. He or his son built a castle, and it remained the property of the family until the 15th century. Edward I went there several times as a visitor, but early in the 14th century the castle was a ruin. Now we can see only two earthworks, one horseshoe-shaped, the other circular, a faint remnant of the great gateway, and bare traces of foundations of inner parts of the castle. There is no doubt of the fortress having been erected by the Warrens, but did they construct the enormous earthworks? Mr. Harrod considers they are not Norman, but Roman, the occupation of the site by the Romans being established, and Roman pottery and coins of Vespasian, Constantine, etc., having been found there. Evidence is then quoted to show that the walls and earthworks were the works of different people, and that the Normans availed themselves of these sites in consequence of their strength. And here, says Mr. Harrod, we see the variety of interest afforded by the study of archaeology. Here is a castle, of which all interesting architectural features have been destroyed, but probably from that very cause our attention is drawn to the remarkable character of the earthworks, and a view of this subject is presented to our notice, which may hereafter be of great use in the investigation of other remains of a similar kind. Murray, again, supports Mr. Harrod, adding on his own behalf the position of Castle Acre on the line of a very ancient road known as the Pedder's Way, must always have been one of very great importance. Of this argument we may dispose at once. It has been seen that, if the Pedder's Way was a military road, its importance was due only to the fact that it led to Brancaster, or towards Brancaster. Brancaster was a fortress and watchtower, seawards against the Saxon pirates, and nothing more. Now let us apply the cold learning and scientific tests of Mr. Haverfield. 
the imperfect rectangular earthwork between the church and the ruins of the saxon and norman castle has generally been taken to represent a roman earthen camp of ten or twelve or according to others twenty-two acres in size and various finds of roman objects have been adduced to support the idea but the camp so far as i can judge without excavation is not definitely roman in character and hardly any of the objects seem to have been found in or near it he then goes through the finds systematically and concludes i cannot regard this meagre and scattered evidence as adequate to prove the camp roman still less to prove it roman of the first century as mr fox suggests it indicates at the utmost a cottage or two standing perhaps by the pedder's way which runs through castle acre parish and earthworks somewhere about a d three hundred this may very likely have been to the north of the parish and not in the vicinity of the camp in truth the best and best authenticated find an intaglio with an emperor's head was made two miles north of the camp where are we then merely in a state of knowing that according to the best authority there is no adequate evidence for believing the earthworks to be roman the problem presented by these earthworks and others is a legitimate subject for conjecture dr jessop in a paper on the saxon boroughs of norfolk appears to think that castle rising castle acre milam elmham and norwich represent a line of saxon fortresses some of them occupying sites which were roman before erected to resist the danes in the ninth century the roman hypothesis he would probably drop in the light of present knowledge and looking at the positions of these places on the map it is not quite apparent to say the least of it why they should have been chosen for points of resistance to invaders from the sea were they then pre-roman that is possible and it is quite consistent with the absence of roman remains for until the saxon shore became a reality the romans had no occasion to fight in east anglia after they had wiped the iceni off the face of the earth and so they had no need for fortresses in it or is it just conceivable that here as has been suggested in the case of castle rising the haughty norman grandees compelled the subjugated country folk by scourge and every brutal method to pile up these huge mounds we can never tell for certain unless the spade be set to work in earnest perhaps not then even but in the meanwhile as we make the run of some twenty miles to lynn it is amusing if somewhat unscientific to speculate nor is speculation any the less entertaining in that much of the basis upon which previous theories have rested has been proved to be unsound let us then think of these mysterious works as we roll home to lynn and having reached it we have also reached the end end of chapter 13 part 3 end of through east anglia in a motor car by j e vincent